Welcome to the One Life One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morris. Today, I have a very, very special guest. He's a great friend, great human, great father, great husband, great tattoo artist, and one of the best hug givers ever. Him and Stephen Adler are tied for the best huggers. When you get a hug from this man, you melt in his arms. Welcome, Lindsey Carmichael. Toby, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's so weird. It's like having a friend is talking in a microphone and headphones in your house. It's awesome. I've been looking forward to it. Um, thank you. So, Lindsey Carmichael, before we get into your, your tattooing, let's go back a bit and um, get into your history growing up, going to high school, going to regular school, your, par- your parents, and just how you became Lindsey Carmichael, like starting in school. Like, did you like school? Did you get good grades? Did you graduate? I graduated. <clears throat> I generally, uh, I, I, I wasn't crazy about school. Yeah. I, I stuck with it and did as best as I could because um, I had a couple of uh, older uh, brothers and sisters who did not do well in school and it disappointed my mom in a way mm. that, uh, it, it, you know, she cared about them the way that she cared about all the rest of us, but that was something that to her was very um, important. Uh, important. Yeah. And she didn't ever push it on me and say anything like, you got to do good because your brothers and sisters did not, not all of them, but a couple. Yeah. But I knew that it was something that I needed to uh, concentrate on as much as I could because uh, I wanted to do something that uh, was, you know, that uh, she, that would make her uh, happy and not give, give her another, uh, give her a feeling of being proud. Yeah. And not yeah. give her another, you know, bum out. Totally. So, are you, are you the youngest? I'm the youngest of five. Damn. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm the youngest of three. Um, so... Oh, I got to tell you, by the way, since you <laughs> mentioned that, yeah. that <clears throat> I've listened to you speak before about your relationship with your brothers, and I've seen it in person here at your house on Christmas and things oh, like yeah, that. Yeah. And I've, um, I've also listened to it on here, and... It's so nice. It's so it's so very nice to hear the way that you guys communicate with each other. And I, I, I realize that that must be what it's like. When I listen to it, it's what I realize what it must be like to be close with family members and to have uh, an unconditional feeling of support and uh, closeness with family members. I get mm. that from, from uh, hearing the way you guys interact. Thank you, man. Thank you. We've come a long way. Uh, we definitely had... Our ups and downs as brothers and living or living around the country from each other and being in band with my brother is kind of hard sometimes. I can imagine. But yeah, we love but we love each other for sure. So you weren't tight with your brothers growing up? No. I was the youngest of the of five kids and I came four years after all of them. So they're all about one year, maximum two years apart from each other, and then there's a four year gap and then me. Wow. Okay. So um all my older brothers and sisters had already you know, they were already kind of moved along in yeah. life, a little bit older. Yeah. And the the sister that I'm closest with in age, uh, you know, we, we just were never really very close. Okay. So uh, I was always just kind of on my own. The black sheep. Yeah. In lots of ways, yes. Yeah. And I sort of connected to my mom, but my dad wasn't in the picture. Okay. So I sort of connected to my mom and it was me and her. A, a lot, and then, but in terms of being close with my brothers and sisters, I was not. And uh, there's some weird resentment and things like that going on with the, with the rest of them for reasons I just can't really figure out. Still, yeah. ha- still haven't been able to figure out. Here, I'm 51 years old, still trying to figure out exactly what that is. But no, wow. I, I, no, I was not that close with them. So you graduated. I graduated high school. Yeah, my my oldest brother, the one who's oldest in the family, was at my graduation, and he said to me. Uh, after everybody was saying congratulations and things like that, he he kind of pulled me aside a tiny bit and said, "Now you did something that I never did." So that was another. Wow. That was maybe one of the reasons, like I kind of knew I was headed towards that. Yeah, and I knew I ended up doing that. It was a good thing. That was a nice compliment for sure. It was. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't a lot of those coming. <laughs> yeah, you know, gr- <laughs> growing up, so it was cool to hear that. Yeah. So did you go? Did you go to college? I went to junior college, which is not college. It was just like a continuation of high school, really. Yeah. For uh, <laughs> for uh, maybe a year or two, and uh, one of them, they, they, I, I, 
I figured out that I could take classes that I was interested in and not things that were mandatory that I had to take, like yeah. in high school, like math and things that I really wasn't that good at. Yeah. So I took music appreciation class and I wrote uh, okay. I wrote a uh, paper uh, um, that I just came across the other day that Leah got out, my wife Leah got mm-hmm. out of storage while I was in New York tattooing. Uh, uh, my final paper was on the Clash, and Sick. I got an A on it. It was the first time I've ever gotten like an A on a paper. It's something you love because it was why. something I knew about, yeah, and cared about. And you loved about, yeah, yeah. And then the other stuff was art appreciation classes, which sort of set me up for tattooing. So, what was your first exposure to music? Okay, in the very beginning, we lived up here. We lived in Los Angeles. I live in Orange County now, but for the first uh, sixteen years of my life, I lived up here. Okay. I was not interested in music in any way, really at all, growing up. I had a couple of 45s, like seven inches that I bought at record stores of like popular songs that were on the radio, That, yeah. but it wasn't a thing that I was really that crazy interested in. And then I started skateboarding when I was uh, 10. Awesome. And then that was when we lived right here by the airport close to you. And then from when we moved... From there to the San Fernando Valley, I was 12. I started going to um, skate parks. This is at the beginning of skate parks. Yeah. This was 1978, 79. Damn, it was, yeah. So this was like when skate parks didn't exist before that. Mm-hmm. They started springing up in places around the country. Yeah. And uh, there was one in the San Fernando Valley called Skater Cross. I used to go there. And I still was not connected to music in any way. I was only identified with skateboarding. That was my first interest in my first interest of my own yeah. in, in life. Yeah, and I was uh, uh, like I, like I mentioned earlier, I was always just sort of off on my own thing. Like I sort of had to navigate shit on my own. Yeah, and uh, sounds sk- like rusty a little bit too. So skateboarding was what I connected with, and that was my own deal. Yeah, it, it wasn't anything that had anything to do with anybody else in my family or anyone I even knew. It was just how'd you find out about it? I I I, I think when I lived here in near the airport. There was a couple people who lived across the street from me who had skateboards and maybe a little bit of a ramp. And this is like, this is like still kind of mid 70s. There was a ramp in this dude's driveway. And I think that's when I first became aware of it by seeing it. Yeah. And I, I don't think I really ever tried to like skate the ramp or anything like that, but it became something I got interested in. I broke out my front teeth uh, skateboarding of the sec- second time I ever got on a skateboard. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's a long story, but uh, <laughs> that's how I ended up with a gold tooth in front. I was going to ask you that. That's how you, yeah, knocked a tooth out. That's, wow. that's my that's my fake tooth that I got from that injury, Fuck. which was forty one years ago. That's crazy. Maybe forty two. But uh, <laughs> then when I moved to the valley, skateboarding became more of a thing that you could see more. Yeah. And uh, I got a subscription to Skateboarder Magazine. This is from the beginning of Skateboarder Magazine. Yeah. And uh, I still have all those, by the way. That's it. Uh, until it went out of business. But wow, I got um, uh, exposure to it through that. And then I started going to this skate park, which was relatively close to my house. I used to skate to. And then through that, I started seeing flyers for bands, shows in like 80, 81. Yeah. Uh, That's before punk rock and skateboarding came together. It was right at the dawning of skateboarding and punk rock coming together. Yeah. And in, okay, I mentioned the skateboarder magazines earlier. Okay, right around the time uh, that this was all happening, skateboarder magazine turned into another magazine called Action Now, and it was right before they folded. It was kind of like an all lifestyle type of magazine. So it was no more skateboarder, it was just called Action Now. And they had interviews in there with bands. And I started seeing the names and pictures of the bands that I had been seeing flyers for at the skate park. Oh, shit. And I started listening to um, the radio station that they played at the skate park, which was K-Rock, which was a lot different then. Yeah. And they used to, I used to go at night on the weekend because I didn't have school the next day. Yeah. And I would, um, <clears throat> uh, they'd play Rodney on the Rock, and he was pretty much play, playing 85% punk rock at that point. Okay. He was the one who pretty much broke punk rock to everybody up here on, on the radio. Oh, okay. Ronnie Bing and Is he still around? Yeah, I see him at Canners from time to time. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no kidding. That's crazy. So uh, yeah, I started hearing the, I started seeing names like Black Flag, X, Weirdos, things like that, Germs, uh, in these flyers at the skate park. And then I started hearing those, oh, Adolescents, I started hearing those bands on Rodney on the Rock at the skate park at night when they would play it over the sound system. Yeah. And then I started playing it at home. And that was my first exposure to music was through skating. 
Fuck. This is at the time that I was like 11, 12 years old. So you remember what your first show was? You sure do. I, I, <laughs> I know you do get good, sto- get good stories. <laughs> Go ahead. I have, I have, speaking of which, I have the ticket stub for this show framed at the house. Uh, That's I, awesome. I still have it, it but it was, um, it was Adolescence, TSOL, Chief Stains, Wasted Youth uh, at Devonshire Downs in the San Fernando Valley, and I'm pretty sure it was May of 81. And um, it was in this big barn, this place called uh, uh, Devonshire Downs that was connected to uh, Cal State University, Northridge. Okay. And I was in junior high school. I was in seventh grade, and it was May. And then in June, I graduated seventh grade. Graduated seventh Same. grade, uh, you know. And then that summer after that, I went to after that I went to that first show. I started going to punk rock shows in Hollywood, kind of regularly. Like sometimes taking the bus, sometimes Damn. getting rides from my mom, picked up from my mom. And this was all eighty one. Wow. Oh, so, oh, I wanted to quickly mention. I didn't mean to cut please, you off. I'm no, sorry. No, but. All of those bands that were on that first show, none of them were had a record that was out at that at that time. They, Damn, they, uh, I'd heard their songs on Rodney on the Rock. Holy shit! So I kind of blindly went to see those bands play because I knew I had some interest in what that was. Yeah, but I didn't know I was going to see TSOL or the Chiefs, or yeah. I knew that they were on the bill. I knew that they were playing, but I wasn't. I had no idea what to expect. Damn, and I was a little kid, so that's fuck. Must have been scary. I too. was. I was not a teenager yet. I was twelve. Damn. I may have just turned 13, but I'm pretty sure I was only 12 years old. So I went alone, and which I still do. Yeah. But uh, I went by myself. I went in there into this enormous barn where they were having this show, and I was <laughs> and I was basically like exposed to everything. I, it's crazy to think, but it's totally true that I was exposed to everything, everything that ended up being my interests all the way up until we're sitting here today mm-hmm. that night. That night happened. And then connected with everything, yeah. It, it, in everything, girls, it, music, <laughs> it, everything. and um, Life changed forever from there, yeah. That is a 100% true statement. Wow. <laughs> so were you, doing, were you doing art this whole time too in your year? Were you into art? Yeah. Alongside I, of all this? Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't something that I was pursuing all the time. It wasn't something that I was like, I, I would make sure that I had things around me to draw. But when I was... Um, sitting at school or when I was uh, trying to, uh, like I was thinking of a band or whatever it was, I would draw the logo for the band sure. or things. And these are just things that I was kind of copying yeah. like by thinking about it, like the way the Circle Jerks logo was. I yeah, could still yeah. draw that or Suicidal Tennis, shit like that. DKs, all that shit. Man. Yeah, exactly. So that was also my first exposure to tattoos and through artwork was through punk rock. Yeah. And, and then when I got to... Uh, in junior high, I had art classes that I did okay in, not nothing, um, nothing outstanding or anything yeah, like yeah. that. And then when I got to high school, which was years later in Orange County, I started taking art classes and realized I had, I didn't, uh, I wasn't excelling crazy, but I realized I could do it. Uh-huh. Like I, I, I wasn't bummed out at everything that I was doing. I was going, man, it doesn't look so bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was getting okay grades at doing these things, and I wasn't really getting okay grades at doing anything else in high school. Yeah. So I did not have any idea that I would end up tattooing later on in life. I had zero idea of that. It wasn't any kind of a pursuit. It wasn't any of a, It wasn't a thought that crossed my mind. Nothing like that. It was just something that I kind of had an idea of how to do and would, did okay at. Yeah. So when you get out of school, you had what was your goals? I didn't have any, man. I my my only goal was to not be in high school because I didn't like it, and I did, wasn't in any rush to go back to any kind of a school setting because it wasn't anything that was. I I didn't have good times with that. Yeah. And um, my mom, after six months of me, or not even that, maybe maybe that summer following <laughs> when I graduated high school. Yeah. So three months or so. Um, my mom said, look, you either have to go to school or you have to get a job or you got to do both if you want to live here. Mm-hmm. And I was only 18 or whatever. Yeah. So I was like, well, fuck, and I don't really know how to move out. I don't have any idea of that yet. So I should um, try to do those things. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, I got, I had a job and then she told me if you don't contribute in some way and financially and if, you, uh, if you're not going to school, then you, you got to figure out something else. Damn. So I started, uh, uh, I went to those 
college class, those junior college classes that I told you about. Yeah. That I did okay at. I, I completed what I signed up for. Mm-hmm. And then um, I realized that it wasn't something that I could do both, was go to uh, like have a full-time job and go to college. There are people that can do yeah, that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. But it wasn't really something I felt like I could con- I could concentrate on both of them. Mm-hmm. So I got a different full-time job at this hardware store and I started, uh, I, I really didn't have any other kind of goal except for making money and I kind of wanted to to play guitar, but I didn't really have a solid idea of that. I just sort of had some weird dream of what it would be like to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I think a lot of people do. Yeah. Did well, you get a guitar and try to play? I did. My daughter has it now. I had two. Awesome. I saved up a bunch of money because I didn't have to really pay. I mean, I gave my mom money. I kicked her down money and shit, but I yeah. wasn't like paying rent. Yeah. Exactly. And I didn't have like a car payment or any of the things that we have as adults now. Yeah. So um, I was able to save a bunch of money at that time in 1986. It was like a lot of money to save up a thousand dollars. Hell yeah! But I did that. I went to uh, the Guitar Center in Santa Ana on Main Street. I bought a Fender um, Strat that was the same exact color on the neck and the body as the one that Johnny Marr used <laughs> and, awesome. and played in pictures that I saw. Yeah. And um, I bought an amp. This was all for under a thousand. I got it for nine hundred. Damn! But it was a long time ago. It's a lot of money back then, though. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. And I I attempted to take guitar lessons, but I don't think I was ready to do it. I don't think I really had as much of an interest to pursue it and make it happen as much as people do. Yeah. And I also didn't really have people around. I didn't have I didn't have a band to play with where they were going like fuck you haven't learned this yet. Yeah. So I just was kind of like trying to work and learn that too, and it didn't. It just never really came together. Yeah. And then uh, I ended up putting that stuff away because I got in a relationship, and this was when I was 19. And um, I ended up not really trying it as much or trying to do it or pursue it as much. Yeah, and no time for it, yeah. I, I did, but I, I, I didn't really pursue it. Yeah. And then uh, years and years and years, all this time later, my daughter... Uh, got a genuine interest in music all completely on her own swear to god yeah not, so you're playing it too that's awesome not from not from pushing anything like yeah. you should try to do this yeah her whole thing was that she um would go to see bands like with me you yeah. leah everybody and she started thinking she told me herself that she started thinking well i mean i could go and see bands and i which i like to go and do and i could like buy records and stuff but i could also try to do that too i could try to play pretty awesome and she did she totally learned on totally learned we got her uh, lessons with someone that we knew uh it was a girl her name's kaylee uh, got her lessons and paid for them and she connected to that person really strongly That's awesome and learned how to play guitar now now totally knows how to play on her own and so yeah. i gave i gave her all that equipment so it did come to it did come to you know yeah to use came later to on. use later yeah. on that's amazing. So she want to play music too? Yeah, yeah. She she's she's in she's she's in a band now with one of her friends who's drums <laughs> and there's two girls. And she's been in a couple of bands. Her first band was called Zero Hour, named after a Plimsoll's record, which Sick. is like to me was all is all like I'm super proud of that. It's awesome. You know, so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so when when did you get your first tattoo and start tattooing? Okay. When I was 14, I went to see um uh, the, I'd been going to shows for a couple of years at this point. Yeah. And I'd been seeing pictures of people in bands with tattoos. Okay. So this was this would be like in Flipside magazine or in punk rock fanzines or sometimes in skateboard magazines where you would see like pictures of Henry Rollins with one tattoo. Yeah. Like one. Right? The and Misfits one or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we had those yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, and and then I started seeing pictures in fanzines of bands from England like GBH or um uh, exploited and they weren't covered in tattoos nah. not nothing like what you or i have today yeah we're fucked they Thanks. yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> but they would have something that was big like here on their forearm yeah or here on their arm and to me it was like heavily tattooed mm-hmm. and i was so knocked out by it i i wasn't knocked out in a way like i was oh i gotta get that too i just was totally baffled at how it even happened in the first place. Mm-hmm. It's like, how the fuck? Where do they go? Yeah. Like, who do they know to do this shit? <laughs> and how do they do it? Yeah. yeah and how does how would it be done? Yeah. So when I was 14, I went to see TSOL again. I, I'd been yeah. seeing them a lot. Now I'm friends with those dudes a long, Great long, band. long way down the line. But um, I went to see them again and I saw these people with tattoos at the show and I kind of knew already that people that were into music and people that were in bands had tattoos. Mm-hmm. But I somehow made the 
direct connection by seeing people up close in the crowd who had tattoos at shows. Okay. I came home and as this is back to when we lived in the San Fernando Valley in, in Tarzana and, and I told my mom, she was like, Oh, how was the, how was the show? She always was cool with me going and yeah. had like interest in what I saw and what I thought. Yeah. And, and she knew you were safe having fun. It wasn't like you were like walling out in the street selling drugs and shit. Like, could, also because she knew that I was not some, that wasn't my interest. Yeah. She also knew that that was something I wouldn't get mixed up in. Yeah. It'd be like the same way now with my own daughter that I would never worry about her being involved in anything like that. Yeah. I just, you know, you she could go drive her car someplace and do different things and I'm not really worried. The only thing I'm worried about is other people, not her. 100%, me too. I know you know. Yeah, exactly. So um, I came home from the show. She asked me how things were and I was like, man, hey, I'm going to get tattooed. I'm going to get a tattoo. And she goes, no, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> but when you're 18, if you still want to get tattooed, you can do whatever you want. Sick. But now you're not going to do that. So to me, in my mind, the way I thought of it was she gave me permission mm-hmm. not to do it then. Yeah. Only thing I had to do was wait four years. That's awesome. So I was like, fucking cool. So silently and to myself, without making it a thing of everybody or even telling my mom about it, I started researching tattoos as much as I could. And in, wow. the, in those days, you couldn't do that. It was yeah, it so w- internet and shit to do that. Yeah. Nope. This is this is it. when I was fourteen. This is like eighty two. Maybe magazines, Outlaw Biker or some shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would get my hands on like uh, any skateboard magazine, which was they didn't even have Thrasher magazine at that point. Yeah. This was just skateboarder. Yeah. And then Action Now. Okay. And so <clears throat> they had some pictures of tattoos on people and um I started looking them up in like libraries and th- anywhere that I could that I could get my hands on any type of a book or magazine that had to do with tattoos. Yeah. And also um I think by the time that I was 14 or 15 the Stray Cats record came out which was the first Stray Cats record. Wow. And at the bottom on the back of the record itself it says tattoos by Bob Roberts and Dennis Cockle. Oh shit, that's cool. He shot them on their record too. Nobody does that. No one did that that's then. That's insane. No, even now that's crazy on the back of a record. Yeah, and it was on the back, not even on the wow. inside. It was on the back at the bottom. That's crazy. So I was like, oh, fuck. I got to figure out who these people are. Yeah. So solidly going to shows in Los Angeles all through this period of time, right? Mm -hmm. So 14 to 18 was what I had before I was going to get tattooed. So (sighs) when I was 15, 16, when I would see people at shows up here, like at the Olympic Auditorium or or anywhere like that, I would ask them, Hey, where'd you get that done? Who did that tattoo? And nine times out of 10, it was Bob Roberts. Damn. So I made the connection that the people that everyone was telling me, that people were telling me here that uh, they got tattooed by Bob Roberts was the same dude who's on the back of the Stray Cats record. Wow. And that's that's also a lot of people got con- got exposed to tattoos and saw them through that band because they were big. Yeah, a lot of tattoos too for being the big band. You're right. And, oh, shit. Yeah. So... Um, when I was 16, I was I, at this point had already kind of been uh, doing a lot of research, and I wasn't saying anything about it to other people. Like I wasn't telling mm-hmm. my mom, "Hey, man, two, I only got two more years before I get yeah, tattooed." I, I just didn't say anything. Yeah, I just kept it to myself. I had the name Bob Roberts in my head, and I knew who, that it was the same person. So I was at the Olympic, and I think the show was um, Conflict. I'm pretty sure it was Conflict. Um, I was in the, there's like this big outside lot, it was a big boxing auditorium in the Olympic and the mm-hmm. show, the lobby was like this big circular area outside where the show yeah. was. And I was standing there talking to my friend Tammy and she already had tattoos. And uh, I was asking her a question about it. She goes, why don't you get one? I go, I'm not old enough to get tattooed yet because she was two years older than me. Yeah. So I go, but when I am old enough, I'm going to get tattooed by Bob Roberts. And she goes, oh, he's standing right there. Oh, shit. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, I got tattooed by him. He's right there. It's him. Holy shit. So I turn around and he's at the show. And I knew that he did go to punk rock shows, but I don't know who the fuck he was. It could have been anybody. Yeah. So I go, I'm going to go talk to him right now. She goes, you should. So I rolled up to him. <laughs> and I was young. I was only 16. Yeah. Were you nervous or anything? No. No. I'm yeah. generally not nervous in that way. Yeah. But um, I knew I, I was c- coming to talk to him about something that was going to be silly to him. Totally. So- I went up to him and he was talking to this dude named Chris D. He used to sing for a band called Flesh Eaters in Los okay. Angeles, so like early, early LA punk band. Yeah. And um, I interrupted their conversation totally. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, um, you're Bob Roberts. And he went, yeah. And he, he's like this gnarly, I mean, he's still a really gnarly fucking dude. I know about, yeah, I've heard, yeah. So, so I was like, hey, I'm not old enough yet to get tattooed, but when I am old enough, when I turn, uh, you know, when I'm old enough, I, I want to get something from you. And he goes, well, how old are you? 
And I go, I'm 16. I got a couple years to go. I'm going to do it. And he goes, well, bring a note from your mom. Wow. And kind of started light clowned on me a little and started laughing with the guy, Chris D, right? And I go, uh-huh. I'll, I go, I'll see you in two years. And he was like, all right, cool. Yeah, nice to meet you. And he gave me a business card, which I still have. Holy shit. Okay. Holy shit. So I put it in my pocket. I would go back to Tammy and she goes, how did it go? I go, oh, good. He gave me his business card. I'm going to get tattooed by that guy. Uh-huh. And then sure enough, dude, I fucking did. When I turned 18, I wow. went and got my first tattoos done from Bob Roberts at Spotlight right here. Yeah. It's, are you serious? So you, just, you, sw- you called him up? You went there? or No, I went one day and, oh, I'm going to get to- You the- held that card so tight for two years. Still have it. Still have it. I've been, I've been holding it all that I time. Eliminate that shit. Yeah, that's awesome. So- <laughs> um, so I had it in my wallet and I knew I was going to get tattooed by Spotlight. I had the, uh, by Bob at Spotlight and I had the address. So, um, two, two more years pass and I'm living in Orange County at this point. I know I'm jumping back and forth it's between okay, LA no, and fine, Orange County, fine. but this is, this, this is the, the time frame was my life. Yeah, man. So I lived in Orange County and then I turned 18 and then my mom at this point worked down here in LA at in downtown LA at this law office. Okay. So keep in mind I'd never said anything to her about getting this tattoo all this time. Even though I remember from years ago she said when you're 18, mm-hmm. you yeah. held on onto that. Yeah, 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 still still do, but I yeah. I I, re- I remembered it so clearly. So she was working down here in downtown. Every once in a while I'd come and meet her for lunch or whatever. So I I had a car and um, I drove down here. I had an appointment with Bob. I cannot remember if I called and made the appointment with him or if I went to the shop and made the appointment with yeah. him. I have a memory of going into the shop and making the appointment Which with him. Which you couldn't do that now, but yeah. N- no, not really. But I remember going, I think I have a memory of going in and making the appointment and he wasn't there. Okay. And I remember thinking to myself, fuck, is it going to work? Is he going to mm-hmm. know that I'm supposed to show up? But on the day that I was supposed to go... I came down here. My appointment was at um, noon, and I, I I drove to downtown. I met my mom. And we went and got like f- food or coffee or something. And she goes, "So what brings you down here? Oh, what, shit. what brings you to downtown today? You just gonna go shopping or something? You're off of work." I go, "You remember that tattoo that I was telling you about when I was 14?" Oh my god! And dude. she goes, "Yeah." And I go, well, "I'm kinda, I came. I got an appointment. I'm gonna get that done today." Holy shit, four <laughs> years you held on to that shit. And she went, well, okay, well, I mean, if you still want it after all this time and you've probably been thinking about it and you know you know what you're going to do, then that'll be great. you know. And she wasn't dismissive or mean or, wow. or bummed on it or anything like that. She was like, oh, cool. So I, <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I'll see you later. Wish me luck. So I drove over to Spotlight, got there at 12, got there a quarter to 12. And then I hung out and waited, and he was a little bit late, but that's that's normal for a tattoo shop type yeah, of thing, yeah, yeah. As, as I find out now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I went in, and I gave him what I wanted to get, and uh, it was the oh, I gotta I gotta quickly backtrack to that, do it, do it to what I was gonna get. Go ahead. Okay, so all this whole time, also, I was trying to figure out what I wanted. Yeah. Because I didn't know exactly for what four I wanted. Years, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for longer than that, really. But yeah. I mean, I, I for that four years, the solidly, countdown, countdown. I was tr- yeah, exactly. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to get. I knew I wanted something solid black, and I knew I didn't want to get black flag bars like everybody else, which I mean, I would, I would, mm-hmm. but then it was a different thing. I didn't want to get black flag bars because I saw them on Henry and I wanted to copy him. I wanted to get something that was solid black, and I knew that it was something I was super into. It's before millions of people had that tattoo. Yeah, I mean, which I, I would totally get myself now, too, yeah, which I never should, ended up getting. Yeah, you should definitely get it. Well, this connects to the person who taught me to tattoo. I know, this is amazing. So, okay, so... <sighs> I went to see the Smiths at uh, the um, at the Universal Amphitheater with my brother yeah. uh, on the last tour, Queen's Dead tour, and then I saw them a week later, exactly a week later at Irvine Meadows. Right? Okay. Okay. With my brother, I ended up with a backstage pass for the for the Smiths show. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, September, I think, of uh, 1986. Okay. So I went to. Um, Universal Amphitheater, I ended up with this backstage pass. I did not end up going backstage. I don't know why, but I still have the pass, and it had like basically a tour logo. Okay. Like, you know how you have a laminate and for a, for a tour, and there's like a certain kind of a, an image that goes just for that sure. just for that year, that sure. summer, or whatever. Well, it was this um, kind of like a, 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 it was in white, but it was sort of like a crest type of a logo. Mm-hmm. So when I saw it and I had it, I was like, this is what I'm getting. Oh shit! So I, awesome. I brought it to him, and I was like, "I want to get this, and I just want it here on the front of my arm." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, no sweat." <laughs> so he put it on the counter, drew it on me with a pen, tattooed it on me. And funny story, um, 
he he goes, is there anything? Okay, well, that's it. And I, I mean, I can't really see it. I'm like looking down doing this. And he's in, it, it was intimidating for me. I was, sure, I was super man. young and I didn't know what to expect. And it kind of hurt. And the whole yeah. thing that goes along with getting a tattoo. So I, he goes, is that it? Is there anything else you want to put with it? You want to put a word with it or anything like that? And I was like, yeah, man, maybe how about my name? And he was like, yeah, yeah. He goes, what's your name again? And I go, Lindsay Carmichael. And he went, okay, spell it. And in my mind, I was thinking Carmichael. I was going to put underneath it. Oh, nice. For sure. Yeah. So I got a, I think it was a napkin that he was like one of the napkins he was using to tattoo with, like a paper towel. Uh huh. And I took a pen and I wrote out my name, how you spell it. Without thinking of anything, he got the same pen and he put above it, like wrote on me lettering. And he was like, it's, and without me looking at what was on me, he pointed at the paper towel, the napkin, and said, like, it's spelled like this, right? And I go, yeah, okay, cool. It just took him a few more minutes and he tattooed it. And it says Lindsay Carmichael, not Car. So I have my first and last name above my, my, my tattoo. <laughs> I, I, I never even seen that. I'll show it to you. So it's your full name on your tattoo? Right above it. That was my first tattoo. Were you bummed? No, not at all. It was cool. I was stoked to get finally fucking get tattooed. Yeah, yeah. So it said Lindsay Carmichael, Carmichael, fucking whatever. I don't <laughs> care. That's my name anyway. <laughs> Holy shit. And so after that, did you get the bug? Did you want to get more tattoos? Immediately. And then I, I, went, I went back exactly a month later, and I got a rose off of the wall. Which is still on the wall now at, at Spotlight Tattoo, oh, where I've gone to work now. It's just yeah, like I'm a, cr- a couple weeks. Yeah, crazy full circle thing that I yeah. now am able to work at that shop, which I'm super proud of. It's fucking crazy. But uh, I, I picked a rose off of the wall and told him what I wanted. It's right here. And then I went back exactly, uh, I think a month after that, and got another big tattoo on the front of my arm. Damn. And I, I, I that after that, I was you know. I was getting tattooed as much as possible after that. So wh- when when did you realize you want to start tattooing? Like what year was that? And what? Okay, I had been getting tattooed from when I turned eighteen until about twenty two or twenty three, and by this point, I'd been tattooed by Bob, a guy who used to work for Bob after he'd moved to Orange County, and he was working at this place called Tattoo Magic, where I ended up doing my apprenticeship was at Tattoo Magic, which okay. this is all not planned. It's okay. just how things fell together. Yeah. And I'd been tattooed by maybe four or five people, three, four, five people at the most. But I wasn't just going willy nilly and going to wherever and going, put this on me, put this on me. Yeah. I was like, I was in the mode of researching all this shit from before I ever got tattooed in the first place. Yeah. Like really thinking about what it was, who it was doing, who, who, doing it, who yeah. was doing it. Because at that point, there wasn't a million people doing tattoos. Mm-hmm. There were people that were super good that were, that you, you, you had to go to them to get this shit done. So up north, whatever. Yeah. So <clears throat> the guy who was tattooing me at Tattoo Magic, his name's Leo, um, he w- was going to be part of this art show that was in Santa Monica. Oh, sorry. I was also corresponding with Ed Hardy at this point. Okay. And wow. it, it was because I knew I wanted to get tattooed by Ed. I never said that to him, but I knew I always wanted to get tattooed by him because I knew that he was like the guy. Yeah. I, I, I knew that he was the guy. Mm-hmm. And, um, there were these these books that he was putting out called Tattoo Time. There was um, black, red, yellow, blue, and white Tattoo Time. They were like a small book kind of okay. a thing. It was like tattoo history and uh, l- a lot of uh, information about uh, current tattooers during that time. Nice. And I'd collected all of them and all the, everything else that Ed Hardy had put out through his book company. It was called Hardy. He was like your favorite. He was like your favorite at the time? Yeah, he still yeah. is. Yeah. Still is. Ed Hardy, awesome. number one, all the way. It's awesome. So he had this book... A company called Hardy Marks, and they put out books that had to do with tattoos. So, I, because of my interest in it, I started collecting all that stuff too. It was also yeah. during the period of time that I was looking at who I wanted to get tattooed by. Yeah, Bob had a shitload of tattoos in those books. Yeah. So, anyway, um, through getting tattooed by Leo, he told me that he was going to be in this art show that was in Santa Monica, and uh, a bunch of coincidentally, a bunch of the people that had been. Um, that, that, that I'd been getting tattooed by had work in this art show. Gotcha. And it wasn't paintings. They were photographs of, they were like professional photographs of people with tattoos by these artists. Gotcha. So I go to the show. I took the day off of work. I worked in a grocery store at this point. I went with my kids, uh, Keith and Bella's mom. <clears throat> She'd been tattooed by a couple of these people too. And we drove up to this show in Santa Monica. And at this point, I swear to God, I had no inclination to be a tattooer. Okay. It didn't cross my mind. I never thought of it. I never thought of it. I didn't think, oh man, this is something I should try to do. Mm-hmm. 
all I knew was that I had some crazy interest in it, and yeah. I, wa- I wanted to be around it all the time. Yeah, you loved. Yeah, I would go to shops, go inside tattoo shops on my days off from work. I would not get tattooed. I wouldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> It's so strange to think of now. research and shit, yeah. But I would just like look around at the flash and things that were on the walls because it was different than now. The stuff that was on flash and tattoo shops at that point was generally done from the people who worked in those shops. Gotcha. And there was only like three, four shops in all of Orange County, if you can imagine that. Okay, that's crazy. And then the ones up here. You intrigued by it. Yeah, Yeah, like crazy intrigue. So I would go and put my hands on Flash and get right next to it and try and figure out how it could possibly be done. I didn't know Damn. how it w- what it was. Yeah, it wasn't because I was trying to re. Um, I wasn't trying to make a version of it or even trying to reproduce it. I just I just was interested in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it was all wrapped up with all this shit. At this point, there's a couple of tattoo magazines that were out that were through um, like. Biker magazines that would put yeah. out all tattoos. Yeah, remember those? Like an all tattoo publication that had to do with mostly biker shit. Mm-hmm. But every once in a while, I would have a thing about the Stray Cats or you know, like a band. Yeah, or Black Flag or something like that. So <clears throat> I go to this art show. I see all the people, a couple of people that I've been getting tattooed by. Ed Hardy's there. Oh shit! Right. And I told him, hey, I'm the guy who's been writing you. And he was writing me letters back and forth about like stuff that was art related, more art related, like uh, about, you know, uh, he put out this book called Rock of Ages. And, it oh, had, yeah, I and, that. and he was talking about like where you would, you know, uh, I, I was talking to him in letters about like things that I saw that had to do with Rock of Ages and he would write me back. And That's cool. we were just in correspondence with each other about art, about yeah. oh, some of it was tattoo art. Most of it was tattoo art. But I never said anything to him about wanting to be a tattooer because I didn't, th- I didn't know that. That's on your mind, yeah. 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 So I go to this show. I introduce myself to Ed. I said hello to the people I'd been tattooed by. We left within a couple of hours. The name of the show was Forever Yes, and there was a book that went along with it. I'll try to give you the condensed version of this. I know It's I- fine, bro. No, it's chill. Okay. <laughs> well, in, in, in the book, it's like a catalog of what's in the show, right? And it's all the photographs that are from the show. And in the back, it's got a list of all the people that are in the show. And it's got their names and then their birth date and then the, uh, and then the shop that they were connected with at that time. So it was like born 1955 you know, yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. it was. That's interesting. So I'm looking in this book on the way home. And I go, uh, one of the people I'd been tattooed by was Freddie Corbin. Yep. And he was a little bit younger than me. Just by a few months, but he was born in 68, and I was born in 67. Okay. So I'm looking at the thing, and I go, man, Freddie is younger than me. <laughs> so I said out loud, you know? Yeah. I go, and, and, and he, he's in this show, and he does great tattoos. And my kid's mom went, you should do it. I swear to God. Just randomly said, yeah. Never in my life. Never in my life, leading up to that moment, did you I ever think about being a tattoo artist? Yeah, but yeah. I never had one of those light bulb moments yeah, where yeah. something goes on, like the light comes on. Yeah, and I remember going, "You're fucking right. That is what I should do." Damn, I've been trying to figure this shit out for all this time. I had no idea that's what I should do, and it was from there that I started pursuing it. Fuck. So you started like what happened? Like the next day, you started drawing stuff, and well, I was already kind of loosely drawing. The, the same way that I had been in like junior college, high school. Yeah, yeah. And I was coming up a little bit with tattoo designs that I wanted to get tattooed on me, but it wasn't something of like, I'm going to draw this thing up. I'm going to bring it in. I want it exactly like this. I was just like trying to work out these designs a little bit at home. Yeah. And then, so I started trying to do that a little bit more. And then um, I went to... Leo, who I'd been getting tattooed by uh, kind of a lot, who was down at Laguna Tattoo at this point, and I'd been getting tattooed by him there too. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, I, I need to see about trying to get a hold of some equipment. And it, in those days, dude, this was like an unapproachable yeah. uh, type of uh, thing. Yeah, now everybody's making, everybody tattooers have their own guns now. It's way different. You, you, you did not talk about how you wanted to do that because you generally get shut down. There was already too many people tattooing. Damn. People didn't need to be talking about that. They they did they weren't welcoming to people who wanted to start tattooing at that point. It's weird. This yeah. is like late 91, early 92. Yeah, I know it's kind of banned in New York too for a while, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
thankfully he was cool about it. Totally. He was like, well, I mean, you know, I can't really tell you exactly where we get all of the equipment that I use, Mm -hmm. but I can point you in the direction of a couple of people and wasn't a dick about it at all. He was super cool. Yeah. And he kind of like, you know, wrote a couple of things down about like, get in touch with this person. They may not sell anything to you, man, but I mean, you could try. Try. So I collected a few things through that on recommendation from him. He pointed me in the right direction. I, I figured it out from there. And I wrote letters to people and asked for, can I have a catalog of this thing? And mm-hmm. some of them didn't even get answered. You know, it was Damn. just like, well, fuck this dude. He doesn't know anything. He, yeah. You know, and I would kind of drop names of people I'd been tattooed by. And I'm pretty sure they probably thought I was lying because mm-hmm. like I'd read those names. Like I've been tattooed by Bob Roberts and Leo Zulueta. Yeah. And they were like, sure you have. <laughs> right. But a couple people wrote me back. I ended up getting a power unit. I got some machines through this company called Spalding and Rogers, which is how a lot of people started back then. I got like a big gigantic thing of black and a bunch of needles and shit. And I didn't know what the fuck I was doing with any YouTube of it. videos, how to do none of that no, shit. No, hell no. And I couldn't no. go down there to the shop with my stuff and go, what do I do? Yeah, they, there's do no way. So I had You're to, on your own. Yeah, 100% on my own, but was used to being on my own Learning and like how yourself. to try, figure it out. Yeah. So. I sort of did that, and it was by gnarly trial and error because I had some terrible experiences with trying to tattoo other people. Oh, oh you did? Yes. You tattoo, tattoo yourself first, though? I did my first tattoos on myself. And awesome. And did first first couple on um, Keith and Bella's mom, and then um, I ended up tattooing people that I worked with at the grocery store, telling them I kind of like knew what I was doing. Wow. But they didn't really give a fuck about what it looked like. They just yeah. knew that somebody was tattooing, and they'd get it for free. So I was just yeah. doing it in my in the garage, literally in the garage. I had Damn. like a small tattoo setup situation, which I thought would be like a small shop, whatever you'd have there. And I was, you know, I just collected a few of the bare things that you needed to do it and t- tried it on my own. Damn. And then from there, um, I got introduced to um, Rick Spellman, who I already knew about through... Uh, Black Flag because he tattooed everything on Henry and everything on everybody in Black Flag and everybody in the Misfits. Got you. And then he's the go-to guy. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a go-to guy like like Bob was. Okay. And then, um, I it, this is a crazy set of circumstances, but I knew somebody. Okay, Rick Spellman had a full-time job at a um at at, at the L.A. Times. Okay. In addition to being a full-time tattooer, so Rick was looking for somebody and he was talking to somebody that I knew at the LA times also who worked there full times with full time with Rick. Okay. And he was telling, Oh, I was trying to get somebody for the shop. I'm t- I need to hire somebody. And this guy was like, Oh, Hey, I know somebody who's trying to learn to tattoo. Oh shit. And he was like, is he, does he have a drug problem? And he was like, no, this, I swear to God, <laughs> he doesn't have any kind of problem like that. Yeah. He's, he, he, he it, I think it might work. He goes, yeah, send him down. And this is after me really blindly trying to like figure Damn. shit out. So this is after a few months of me trying to like tattoo people and it was a nightmare. Did you see yourself getting better though? No. Okay. <laughs> I saw only the <laughs> slightest improvement, man. Okay. Just the slightest little improvement. And that was just through repetition. Was it frustrating? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100% frustrating. But it's through, it would be like if you tried to, um, you know, practice with a band and you just suck for the longest time but through interest and through trying to pursue it going like i know i can make it better you might not be that great for a long time but it doesn't make you stop doing it it makes you want to try and improve yeah so like just by being in a room with four or five people and trying to do these songs you try to cover a song from your favorite band by the 20th time that you do it you're like what well, sounds more like it yeah yeah it was kind yeah, of like motivation that. too yeah for sure so I had kind of been a poor excuse of a photo album, and I set up a time to go figure out, to talk to him, and I went, and I'd already been to his shop because I'd been tattooed by Leo at that shop. Okay. So I went in, and I was he was like, hey, you must be Lindsay. I was like, yeah. I gave him my portfolio. He looked at it. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> Dude, Toby, the work was junk. It was, it was terrible, but I was trying. Yeah, you're trying. And then he had these tattoo machines for sale. And uh, I knew that he had the tattoo machines for sale through the my friend who worked with him at the Times. Okay. And um, I was like, hey, he was like, well, it's pretty rough around the edges, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll keep you in mind. And I was like, cool. I was just glad to meet him. Totally. Because he tattooed everybody that I was like a gigantic fan of yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in music, which got me started in the first fucking place. Yeah. It was even interested at all. Black Flag. Black Flag. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Misfits. Yeah, and, of course. And everybody. So I... um. 
I met him finally. I met him and I was like, hey, I've been to your shop so many fucking times. You've never been here. And he was like, I'm always at the LA Times. And I was like, yeah, no, I know, you know? Oh, shit. It's and such a random thing. So Crazy. I said, hey, I heard that you sell tattoo machines. And he was like, yeah, I got a couple right here. And I was, I had money saved up to buy one. Shit. So he was like, well, what do you like? And I go, I need to get a liner. I don't, my liner that I have is no good. And he was like, well, you can use one of these. Try this out. So I, I plugged him in and sort of like fired him up on his, on his power and like at his yeah. shop on, at his station. That was a little <laughs> intimidating because I didn't really know what to look for. I just knew I wanted something yeah, better than. Yeah, they were good or not. Yeah. How the fuck would I know? <laughs> so I, uh, the, all I knew is that they would, they would just by default, they would have to run better than what I had. So, because he was a tattooer. Yeah. So I chose the one that I chose based on the color of it. It was okay. yellow and black. I was like, this one's cool. <laughs> so I ran it a little bit. I was like, yeah, this one's cool. And he was like, okay, cool. He goes, they're 300 bucks, like really firm. That's a lot back then. He's too, like, man. they're 300. I go, dude, I, I put, I, I got $300. I gave it to him. That's a lot of money back then, too. For me, it sure was. Yeah. And uh, for anybody really at that point. So, so you came with the money, yeah. I bought the machine and I split. I went home and it was like, well, how do you think that it went? And I go, I don't think he's going to hire me. I don't think he really wants to hire me, but I did buy a machine and I'm stoked that I met him. And then on the very next day, he called my house. He had my phone number and he left a, a, a message on my answering machine saying that he needed to hire somebody and would I be interested in coming down and learning. Wow, I think he just liked you too and liked you, knew you you like focused on it too. Maybe. I don't know what it was, but he ended up teaching me and then it's so crazy because wow. the, he did the tattoos on the fucking people in the first place that may, opened my eyes to tattoos yeah, at all. Yeah, full circle, yeah. And then he ended up teaching me. I apprenticed. I had a working apprenticeship with him for five years. <sighs> I know, it's, amazing. A, it's a whirlwind. But yeah, that, but yeah, but so how does Henry Rollins come into the mix? Okay. <laughs> all right so in those days you'll remember this <clears throat> you could send a self-addressed stamped letter to an address that was on the back of a, of a record or in the liner notes of an album 100 and you would send them a buck or something with your info and they would send you like a sticker a catalog or something yep or anything like that yeah so i sent letters to the band aggression in um in oxnard Black Flag, countless letters to Black Flag. Um, I was on their mailing list, and I have a bunch of flyers that they sent to me that were from the address that I sent them when I first started That's writing them letters. But it wasn't because I asked them to send me flyers. Yeah. It was, I was just asking them questions the same way that I did with Ed Hardy, mm -hmm. with the tattoo thing. Yeah, exactly. That's how I knew to write Ed. Okay. Was through writing bands. Gotcha. I just figured, oh, fuck, I'll write him a letter. Yeah, and that's how you did it back then. Postcards, letters, yeah, yeah. Totally. Sure. I still have all the, all those letters. That's awesome. Suicidal Tendencies, Sin 34, all these bands. Sin 34. Remember them, go ahead. So they were also from here, from Venice. Okay. So all these fucking bands I had these letters from, right? So one of them I wrote, okay, um, Black Flag used to play free shows from time to time in the daytime, and they played at the Westwood... They played in Westwood at this federal building that's right off the 405. Okay. And um, I went to the show, and it was for pot legalization, and I knew that Henry was straight edge. <laughs> so so in, one of the, in this letter, I wrote him, and I was like, hey, hey um, I just wrote Black Flag, and I put Henry Rollins, because at this point, now he was in the band. Gotcha. First two times I saw Black Flag, Henry wasn't even in the band. Yeah. So... I wrote him this letter and I was, and I, I talked about a couple of other different things. Well, the main thing that I wanted to know was why he played this show if it was for pot legalization, if he was straight edge. Ah! It's weird that I would put him on the spot like that's, that because you're it's. You're a kid not, though. You don't fucking think that's out like. Out of, it's not something that I would do now because it's so, it's so assumptive and it's also, 100%. it's also kind of accusing a little bit. 100%. But you're a kid. You don't know how it's coming off and shit. Yeah. So I didn't know. So it came from a good place. You're I, actually concerned. It seems like you were like, what? Maybe the there might have been a little bit of that. Like, did you start smoking weed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the, <laughs> the other thing was, who does your tattoos? So oh, sure enough, man, I fucking walk home from school. It's when I'm in high school in Orange County at this point, And we had a mailbox, like the kind you put the key and open it up yep. in the front of the complex. I open it up. There's a letter, SST. And I'd gotten a few of those before for, with, with um, when, when I'd written them letters before. How fast was that response? It was maybe a couple, maybe a month, maybe yeah. less. I wrote a letter to Ian Mackay one time too, minor threat, and he wrote me back. I I'll, got one too. I'll, I'll, okay, cool. I got a postcard I'll, in there too. I'm gonna, tell you, I'm gonna tell you that one in a minute. All right, cool. That's a good one. I got one too, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so he, he, I'm like, oh, fucking cool. I get home, I got my room, shut the door, I open the letter, right? And he addressed all my questions, and he was like, and he answered them in this weird way that was like, not, it was like topic, response, topic, Damn. response, all in a row. And it said, pot smoking, 
or something to this extent, and then a dash, and it said, fuck it, I will play anywhere. So he didn't care. It was just a live show, right? And then it said, tattoos. I get tattooed by Rick Spellman. He's clean and cheap. Here's his phone number. And he gave me his home phone number. Wow. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. So I was young. That's crazy back then. Man. I was I was 15 at this point when I got that letter. And this is after I'd seen Black Flag a bunch of times oh, in, at this yeah. federal building show. So sure enough, man, same way that I went up to Bob Roberts, I just fucking called him. And I didn't know it was his house. I thought it was a shop. Holy shit. So he's like, hello. And I go, hey, um, is Rick Spellman there? He's like, this is Rick. Like already kind of <laughs> like, like, like this isn't a good, a good time, you know? And I go, hey, listen, um, I, got your, I got your number. Um, I wanted to get tattooed. I'm not old enough to get tattooed yet. But when I am old enough, I got some people I want to get tattooed by. And um, Henry told me that, you know, you do his tattoos. And he goes, Henry gave you my phone number? And I go, yeah. And he was like, yeah, okay. Like, this is something like he does this. He gives people my home phone number <laughs> kind of a response, you know? Yeah. I forget what the exact words were, but it was like, fuck, okay. Here we go again. Yeah, yeah here's this. So <laughs> he goes, well, okay, well, you know, I'll talk to you later. And I was like, cool, man. It's great to talk to you. I'm, I'm a big fan or whatever. And he was like, all right, let's talk to you later. So then all this uh-huh. time later, sure enough, I end up fucking learning the tattoo from Rick. It's fucking crazy, man. I, so I did not mention the phone call <laughs> until after I'd been working with him for a few months. Yeah. But we talked about music all the time. We talked about mainly Black Flag. And I did not talk to him about how Henry gave him gave me his phone number until later. That. I did later. Okay. So there was more time to talk at that point because there wasn't a whole bunch of people working in the shop. It was just Rick and me. Totally. So he... um. He one day we're sitting there talking. And we had to do. We were talking about Black Flag and shit. And I was like, "Hey, man, you know, I called you up one time." And he was like, "When?" And I go, "It was years ago. It was like in the mid '80s. Dude, it was like '83. I was 15." And Henry gave me your phone number, and I wrote him this letter, and he wrote me back and gave me your fucking phone number and told me <laughs> that you did his tattoos. And he was like, "Yeah." I got a few phone calls like that, man. I don't remember exactly, but there were a lot of people who called the house. And, Holy shit. And it was because Henry was giving my phone number out. <laughs> That's great. So just a random person on the postcard. Totally. Fuck. Can't so, do that shit now. So then here, here, all this time later, I was like, dude, Rick, man, fucking, it's crazy. I ended up working for you. Yeah. But he wouldn't really <laughs> ever, like, to me, I was like full of enthusiasm going like, this is the fucking best. He was so hyped. Yeah. And he was, just, he'd be like, okay, dude, it's, it's so down. It, everything's cool. <laughs> so that's how, that's the Henry connection. But did you ever meet Henry and tell him that story? Yeah, it's crazy. Oh my god, it's crazy. <laughs> totally. So uh, much time later, because I met him in person the second show he ever, or sorry, third show he ever sang for Black Flag. Okay, that was also at Devonshire Downs in the San Fernando Valley, where I went to my first shows. Okay, so uh, it was Black Flag, Fear Stains, Caustic Cause, and a band called Youth Gone Mad. Fear Stains. Cost to cause youth gone mad at at Devonshire Downs. At this point, I was 14. So my mom dropped me off early. I go to the show in the daylight, and they were sound checking inside. So so there's a bunch of people that are sitting on the floor in this barn at Devonshire Downs a a few years after my first show, two years after my first show. And they're just sitting cross legged looking at the band in midday, like they're sound checking. Yeah. So I don't know what made me want to go over there early. I think I was just excited to go to the show. Mm -hmm. So I go in there, I'm watching, and there's some dude up there singing that was not Dez. Dez was in the band, but he was playing guitar. So my first thought was that they let their roadie sound check the song. Like this this guy, crazy dude. Because that happens for sure, yeah. You know? So (laughs) uh, they they were doing, um, I can remember what song is in a minute, but I can't at this moment. I, I do know what it was. But I'm watching, and this is during the sound check. It's like four in the afternoon, and he's wearing this um, T-shirt with sleeves cut off, and he ripped his shirt in half off of him during the sound check. So I remember going, fuck, this dude's wild. (laughs) And it was Henry Rollins. Holy shit. So I stay for the whole show, watch the whole thing, and then after the show, I was supposed to call my mom from this payphone that was in the parking lot. So no cell phones uh, no back then no Pay that, phones, yeah. that was like not a thing yeah not even a, that was like a thing from outer space that's crazy so i <laughs> waited to call her up and i went out and back after the show to hang out and try and meet the band <laughs> so henry's back there and he's talking with these dudes that were in this band called circle one i heard that name yeah they, they were from around here yeah. they were from like redondo or something uh, the, the, yeah lennox or something like here near south bay 
I think it's called the South. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, they were hanging around talking with Henry, and he had this stack of black and white photos that Ed Culver had taken from the first shows that Henry sang with Black Flag at the Cuckoo's Nest in 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 or in uh, in Costa Mesa. Okay. So he's looking through these pictures, and I'm standing next to him, and he's going, "Oh, this is like a really good shot of everybody moving in one picture. This is one of me jumping off the stage. These are all pictures that are now famous photos. I'm sure. And he's looking at them for the first time, and I was standing there. So he was a kid just hanging yeah totally and i was like fucking this dude sings for them now i guess this guy's like their singer all the time i was mm-hmm. figuring this out as it goes yeah so <laughs> okay when i started working for rick that's the first time i met him when i started working for rick Rollins band played with uh this band helmet that, uh from the 90s yeah, was helmet, yeah and um we went to the show rick got us in we went after the show uh backstage we're hanging out in their dressing room and shit and um he rick introduced me he's like oh this is lindsay's working for me now and i go hey we've met before i met you at uh devonshire downs in 1982 i think or 81 or 82 and he went right um uh fear uh, stains, caustic cause, and went down the rundown of the show in his mind. Damn. Like remembered it immediately. It's pretty awesome. And and I go, yeah, I met you after the show. You had a stack of pictures, these black and white eight by tens of uh, the Cuckoo's Nest shows. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I remember. Not that he remembered specifically me being there, but yeah. he remembered all the events of what happened at the show. Fucking awesome. So I met him then, and then not that long ago, two years ago, <laughs> Toby, two years ago, <laughs> me, Leah. And my daughter were at this uh, outdoor type of a show where Iggy Pop played uh, next to the Coliseum up here. Okay. This is just two years ago. It was 2017. And so Leah, my wife, by the way, obsessed with Henry Rollins. Okay. Like- My wife too, because Max's middle name is Henry because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she's crazy about Henry Rollins, always has uh-huh. been. She like, thinks that he's like a good dreamy looking, good, yeah. dreamy guy. So, Me too. So we're standing uh, around in the back. Thankfully, we're super lucky that we were able to hang out in the back. We got on stage for Iggy Pop and shit. It was fucking awesome. I never take any of that stuff for granted. That all to me is like, I love that stuff. Yeah. I cannot get enough of those things. So we're standing in the back and I look up and I can see Henry Rollins is on stage watching some other band. I didn't know who they were. And I go over to Leah and I was like, yo, Henry Rollins is here. And she, <laughs> she goes, no, it's just somebody who looks like him. I go, it's him. He's standing right there. I know is what he looks his like. his hair grown out a little bit gray? Longer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. just two years ago. Yeah. So I go, come here and look. So she comes over and he's standing kind of like over there. She's like, it's him. I go, I'm going to talk to him. So <laughs> he comes down and I go, hey, listen, I know you probably get this shit all the time, but um, I learned to tattoo pretty much because of you from Rick Spellman. And I was through this letter and you wrote me and I told him the whole thing. And he didn't remember writing the letter or anything like that, but he was like, how's Rick doing? And we ended up talking for a while. And we talked about Black Flag. We talked about the connection with how I started tattooing. I go, man, I pretty much have you to thank for that. And he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, cool. It was totally fucking cool about it. We took pictures together, but I got a chance to tell him that myself. That's fucking awesome. It was great, man. Leah took pictures with him too, by the way. Wow, man. So yeah, just that effect, just writing you back and just that changed everything for you. It did. So how many years tattooing now? 27 as of this month. <sighs> so shit. And so now your son has tattoos. My son just started tattooing. I know, but when did he get his first tattoo? How old, how old do you have to be for 18. You? Okay. 18. He wanted to get tattooed before that and didn't really understand the whole deal in terms of like, you got to wait. And he, you, had to, you had to do the same thing. That's what I told him. Yeah. I was like, yo, dude, it's not only is it just like the rule or not the, not even just the same thing that I had to do, but it's the law, man. The law. It's just how it goes. You got to be you got to be 18. Yeah. He was like, well, what if I just get something little? I was like, it's against the law, dude. And yeah. besides that, I wouldn't fucking do it. I waited. Yeah. You got to wait. Yeah. So he had a little bit of trouble understanding that concept to begin with. Now he, now he gets it. Yeah. But at the time, he was just like, I don't get how you're completely covered in tattoos. Everybody that you know is, and you won't do something like small. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I'm like, this might make sense to you later, yeah. but that's what's going on. Yeah. So he waited till he was 18. I tattooed him on his 18th birthday. Holy shit. He got the Bones logo. Oh yeah, skateboarding of the yeah of the of the Bones skull Ripper. the skull coming through the skin. Bones Ripper, or, or his forearm right here, first tattoo. Sick. 
I got to see that. That's awesome. Good fucking choice for a first it tattoo. Is a great choice. And it also goes back to the whole tattoo skateboard, <laughs> skateboard tech connection you, with me. Yeah, man. So, and that was completely, swear to God, it was completely on his own. I never said, oh, it'd be cool if you got that. Yeah. He told me that's what he wanted. I was like, you got it. Yeah. So after that, I ended up doing a bunch of tattoos on him. I did Damn. maybe, I don't know. I did maybe 60% or something. Is it, is it weird tattooing your kid at first? No. Everybody asked me that, but I think it was because of the amount of time that I'd been doing it. I got past any kind of like weirdness about tattooing like other tattooers, famous people, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. So tattooing my son to me was just like, fucking, this is rad. Yeah. Man, this is like a great moment. Yeah. I'm stoked. Let's yeah. fucking do this thing. Yeah. It would be like going to a show with your kid or driving cross country or something yeah. that it's not a nervous thing. It's like fucking awesome let's and he go tattooed you before too before that right yeah he tattooed no not before that no okay it was only after he started getting tattoos oh wow and then he tat uh he tattooed me my daughter tattooed me uh leah's tattooed me you have yeah mackie yeah mackie that was sick yeah fuck and that was like great come full circle you're at spotlight tattoo and mackie from the chromax tattoo that's pretty, i know i know it's pretty amazing man trust me i'm not lost on those things man those things to me are just as important maybe more more really now than uh, they hold they hold just as much weight maybe more than they ever would have before yeah it's crazy how tattooing is now like my son told me that kids are like doing hand poke tattoos in the Mm -hmm. back of the classroom i know he asked me to get tattooed too he goes can i get a hand poked i'm like no all your freaking uncles are all like tattoo artists you want to get tattooed wait you eat the same thing as you it's just it's so different now the tattoos too man i think that what they see and it's not really any fault of anybody i think it's just what they see is Everyone has tattoos, and if you're around it and you're around it all the time and shit, they don't see any. They don't see why it would be strange to get a tattoo before you turn 18, because the people that they see are generally not 18 and have a bunch of tattoos on them. They're not, and they take it into their own hands to do hand poke tattoos on each other and shit. It's not this insane act as it was to me when I was their age. Like back then, it was like this fucking insane act of like mm-hmm. man you're making this gigantic commitment the rest of your life yeah yeah just... and it wasn't something that i was like d- drawn away from because of that it pulled yeah. me to it because of that yeah but it's such a it outcast shit like the weirdos and shit the freaks we had tattoos. to the max to the max 100 yeah. percent. yeah so when they see it like my son too when he was younger when he when he saw people that had tattoos he didn't get that there was this thing that was connected to man you cannot do that until at least until you're 18 to do that yeah which i think is a solid uh s- strong rule to go by now too yeah, there's like underage rappers that my son was showing me. They're all faces are tattered already. It's that like, blows my fucking it's mind. It's completely backwards almost because for us it was like a re- not respecting, but you get like your body suit first, and then you get then you get to your hands, you get to your neck, and mm-hmm. now it's just like they call. Well, I had it written down too. It was like uh, the face. It was like called uh, they call it the warp tour body suit. They call it like scars and mittens and stuff. Yeah, warp, <laughs> warp tour body suit is what I've always heard. <laughs> this is neck and their hands first. It's it's insane to me, man. It is to me too. It seems so strange because back when I started getting tattooed, you would get your arms done, not even your legs. You'd get like your arms done. Then you'd get some stuff done on your legs. And if you were moving anywhere near your neck at all or your hands, you you'd had body work. One hundred percent. Like off of your legs and your arms, those were pretty much like getting filled up. You started getting stuff done on your body your back your chest and stuff like that then you could move on to these other areas and that was almost an unspoken rule inside tattoo shops too when people come in and say like i want to get this thing on my neck it was like in the days long before the computer would be like no 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 no. you want to do that yo check this out we're not going to do that number one Mm -hmm. and you probably shouldn't until you get some like work done yeah these days 2019 you try to explain that to somebody it's the same theory as what we were talking about with our kids they're going, what are you talking about? It's, totally, it's, it's, it's the norm. It's completely the norm. They're like, well, you get tattoos on your body first before you get something done on your neck? Fuck that. I want this done on my neck. Yeah. And if you don't do it because you're going along with whatever rules that you see is important to you and you want yeah. to hold them Values up. Values and shit, yeah. Right. Th- there's somebody that'll do it two doors down. I know, man. So it's a crazy thing, but it's it's reality. It is. It's crazy how um, people are just getting stuff to get it and there's like really no meaning behind it too. I obviously have some goofy tattoos of E.T. was one of my favorite movies. I got some funny shit, but it's all part of my life. I'm just like, I'm not getting random shit like on my face and my hands that like, that doesn't mean anything to me. No, when I got- It's all image and stuff, you know? It's like a strange image thing and I honestly- Like an accessory. Yeah, totally like an accessory. And that's what I was just about to say is that I feel like they're, when they get that stuff done that they don't, 
Maybe they do. I could be wrong. I yeah. don't. I don't really know. I'm not in their head. I don't really know. Yeah. But what I feel like is that it's such a commonplace thing that I feel like they're not really getting the full concept of yo. You get your fucking face tattooed, man. Like that's a. It's a huge step. Commitment. But because they see it so frequently everywhere in the world, it's like yeah, it's like a little wild or whatever. But I mean, it's like coloring your hair. Or yeah. painting your nails. Yeah. Something like that. Because back then it was just, it was super shocking and people would, you know, think you're a criminal and not want to hang, sit next to you on the train and shit like that. Okay. And- now, this is something that has to do with what I, what, the reason why I started getting tattooed in the first. I started getting tattooed in the very first place because I did not want to look like other people. 100%. I, I, I wanted to be apart from people that, uh, to me, were not anybody that I wanted to be around or associated with. 100%. So... It, for, for me, the step of getting tattooed and getting heavily tattooed was something that I wanted to be a part, a, a, a way mm-hmm. from, 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 from it to not be associated with in any of that stuff. Yeah. And I feel like now people get tattooed to be associated with yeah. a, a, a look. It's so true, man. And it's so opposite of what any reason why you or I or most people, I feel like most people that you or I know, Dan, you, Tim, people like yeah. that, are, are people that probably think the same way and that they wanted to be away from all of that. And that's why they kind of started on getting lots of tattoos. And be, besides the hip hop influence, because I know Lil Wayne was like one of the first rappers to have his face tattooed. Do you think the, te- the TV shows back then made tattooing wonderful because more and more tattooers got more business because it was more acceptable or it also made it possible for people who really weren't that good to open up a shop because everybody's tattooing like did it kind of hurt and help the tattoo community i feel like it did both yeah i can't complain about what the shows did yeah because they brought a lot of um interest to the tattoo shop in a positive way mm-hmm. where i worked at the time i was working at laguna tattoo yep and I was on one of them. I was on the same uh, episode of Miami Inc. that you guys were on. That's right. You were. That's right, dude. So I, I, got, that was ta- fun. I got tattooed. And um, that exposure and that people seeing that stuff only brought positive um, uh, uh, reinforcement and positive effects to, to my life and, and my tattoo life. Yeah. And I cannot complain about that because it went really good for me. Yeah. I had tattooed a couple of bands at that point. Uh, the main one that I should definitely shout out is AFI who got tattooed by me within the first like four years of me tattooing. It's awesome. And for almost every record, almost every single record, my name's on it. And That's they say, awesome. got tattooed by such and like such. Like the Stray Cats did. Dude. <laughs> Holy shit. Right. Holy shit, that's awesome, man. So it was like Jim Miner, Lindsey Carmichael would have the, yeah. like the city that I was tattooing in or the shop that I was tattooing mm-hmm. in. And this is for like record after record after record. Yeah. So I can I, I, I'll endlessly thank them for that because it was a it was a great great big push for me yeah. that other people didn't really have. Yeah. So that in connection with the with the the the, the, the Miami Inc thing. Yeah. When people started hearing my name through that and making the connection through seeing my name on records, like AFI's it's records, awesome. then they started wanting to get tattooed by me, and it pushed me up to like another. Uh, Open the doors uh, for you. Uh, it opened a lot of doors. Yeah, and it ended up pushing me uh, to when I when I left Laguna Tattoo, where I ended up at Gold Rush Tattoo, where I tattooed you. And, yeah, man. and you tattooed me, and that's where I tattooed yeah. Keith, my son, yeah. and all that stuff. That that all of that stuff would have never really, probably never really happened had I not had that exposure. Yeah. So for the, I mean, I had been tattooing for a super long time at that point, but that wasn't all it was. Mm-hmm. And so I, those things only brought positive encouragement and positive things for me. Yeah. In in my in my tattoo life and in my life in general, but it also opened the door to a lot of people who had nothing to do with tattoos and exposed them to that and wanted, like you said, wanted to learn to tattoo, open a shop. Yeah, it looks easy. It looks easy, exactly. Let's capitalize on this, whatever, yeah. And that, that was all things that, to me, were like nearly impossible things to achieve. So by the time that I got to that point and was able to like make some headway, make some room doing that, and then um, you know the show and all of that stuff... To to me, that was a whole different view of what that what what, what kind of positive encouragement that brought because it, yeah. it brought it brought encouragement to other people who didn't have any of that background. Yeah, you know, 
It's crazy. Um, shit. Fuck, we're talking about tattoo stories of the day, too. Like, getting my first tattoo, a Peter tattoo uh, from Cindy. Uh, me and Pete getting tattooed on Avenue B in Siv's apartment when he first getting tattooed. I love it. Some of my first tattoos are from there. Um, you actually have a cool story that I thought was amazing. And it's before I knew you. Obviously, I met you before, but I also knew the name before we became close friends. But uh, somebody walking into your shop wanted to get their knuckles done. Can you tell that story? <laughs> Remind me of what it was, because there were so many knuckle tattoos. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All I right. love this story because it's so random and by himself. It's just crazy. Okay, this is wild. <laughs> okay. I went and did a guest spot up north at this place called Spider Murphy's, right? Yeah. And it's in uh, San Rafael. Okay, San Rafael is sort of like, I think, I don't really know this exactly, but it's sci- it's sort of like a, uh, an affluent kind of a community up there. Like okay. you, there's big houses and people who have some money and shit like is that. Up north? Yeah. Okay. So you kind of like, if you go to San Francisco to get tattooed and you go over to San Rafael, you have to like kind of cross a couple of bridges and go over into like a whole different area. Yeah. Right? It's still the up north vibe, but it's not San Francisco. It's outside of there. So when they say they live in San Francisco, it's not really, I got you. In that area, it's like different. Yeah. So, the Calabasas of maybe, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's, that's a good comparison. Okay. So I go in and I was covering for, um, I was covering for someone who was out of town and, um, they were having people come and guest like for three, four days at a time. I went up for those four days and then Dan Smith came up four days oh, shit. right okay. after me. Awesome. So I'm hanging out in the shop and all I was really meant to do was I had one appointment, but I was supposed to be there to hang out to cover walk-ins. Yeah. So sure enough, a walk-in, Toby. Fuck, man. This is before you and I, we knew each other a little bit, yeah. but I remember we talked about this at Luke right. Westman's birthday party. Yeah, dude. Because it was right after it happened. Yeah. So... I'm in the shop. I'm hanging out. I was just doing some drawings and hanging around. I wasn't doing a tattoo. And the shop helper comes in the back and goes, hey, um, do you want to tattoo James Hetfield? Dude. And I go, <laughs> what? And she goes, yeah, he's here. I don't know. He comes in sometimes. He gets like little tattoos done. He's here right now. Do you want to tattoo him? And I go, yeah. So I'm in the back of the shop. I look like this towards the front of the shop. Sure enough, fucking James Hetfield. All by himself. Metallica's standing there. It's fucking crazy, dude. Right? So I go, yeah. <laughs> I go, yeah, fuck yeah. So I walk up and I go, what's he want to get? She, she goes, there's some lettering or something like that. So at this point, I didn't know the extent some of it. Some lettering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I walk up to him and I go, hey, uh, how's it going? I, I go, my name's Lindsay. And he was like, hey, um they said that you're the guy you do lettering or something like that. And you'd be the one to do this tattoo. And I go, yeah, man, what do you want to get? And he goes, I want to get, um, across my fingers, like on my knuckles. I want to get riff life. So hard. And I go, yeah, fucking (laughs) that'd be great. Right. He's the only person that could get that. Fuck man. So he goes, (sighs) so he goes, um, yeah, man. I mean, I was just thinking that, you know, and like whatever lettering you think would look good. And I go, cool, man. I go, do you want to do it today? And he goes, no better time than the present. Let's do it right now. Damn, dude. And I go, fuck yeah. So let me go get set up. And I go, he goes, yeah. <laughs> so I felt kind of bad because he's this, you know, he's a famous person. Dude. And he was like sitting in the waiting room looking at his phone. And I was like in the back, like getting set up thinking, oh, I don't want to make him wait. It's so crazy, man. So, and it was completely random. There could have been anybody there doing that yeah. tattoo. So I go in the back, I set up, and these dudes are kind of used to seeing him come in. So they were they know that I'm like a music fan, and yeah. they were like stoked on it. You like Metallica, right? Yeah. So I yeah. was like, I was like, fuck, this is wild. And they were like, dude, you're gonna. T-. I go. There, there's a guy there named Brian <laughs> who's going. He was like, dude. There's nobody better to do this tattoo right now, man. It's fucking awesome. It works out cool that you're doing it. Yeah. They're like, hey, after he left, the same guy, Brian, goes, dude, we all work here, and it would have been cool to do that tattoo. I'm so fucking glad you ended up doing that. so nice, man. So uh, he comes in the back, and I draw it on his fingers, because you can't really lay out stencils on fingers, Mm -hmm. you know? So I drew it on him with a pen, and I was like, what do you think? And he was like, yeah, I mean, he's like looking at his fingers going, yeah, it's cool. Fuck, and let's go. Like, wasn't he was like, let's do it. Fuck. So I go, okay, here we go. So I start tattooing him and we start talking about music, right? Yeah. And I was telling him about like Does thing- he know that you know does he know that you know it's him? Yeah, he knew. Okay, okay. He, he, he knew because I kind of just mentioned a couple of things, but I wasn't going, fucking this is awesome, Metallica. Yeah. I just said a couple of things about like, oh, I heard that you lived up in this area. Okay. That kind of a thing. Yeah. So um I do the, I'm starting the tattoo. I start talking to him. And it, as it turns out, 
Metal or James Hetfield in particular is like a crazy punk rock fan, knows all about punk and like misfits, especially, yeah, totally. And it, as it turned out, so crazy. One of the first times that Leah, my wife, and I went to London together for the London Tattoo Convention. This is like 2008 or nine. Yeah. Um, 2008 or nine. Uh, we went, we were trying to see if bands were playing while we were there. And um, Discharge was playing at this place called The Gaff in London. Okay. On one of the nights at the convention on the Saturday night. Mm-hmm. So she and I took a cab, went to the show, barely got in, watched the band. It was like not the best time I've ever seen Discharge. It was just one member mm-hmm. and like all these other fill-in people and shit. It was cool. It was cool. And I was glad that Leah could see it Yeah, because Leah didn't get to see Discharge in 1983 mm-hmm. in Los Angeles or yeah. any of that shit. So it was cool that she got to go. And we can say that we went to a fucking Discharge show in England. That's it was sick. it was cool. It's awesome. So we start talking. He was like, so he starts telling me about how what when I'm tattooing his fingers about how he really likes Discharge. And I was like, yeah. He goes, you ever seen Discharge? I go, yeah, dude. I fucking got on stage with Cal when I was um, 15 at this place called Perkins Palace in, in Pasadena and I sang um, Born to Die in the Gutter with him and he was like, oh, it's fucking cool, man. He goes, I didn't get to see them back then. He goes, but I did see them in England one time in like 2009. <laughs> we were at the same fucking show, Toby. Holy shit. He goes, I saw him at this place <laughs> called, the, called The Gaff and we, I, go, uh. I go, whoa, hold on. I go, was it them and like some, this other, I remember that at the time, I remember the name of the opening band and he goes, yeah. And I go, how did you go in there and not like have people tripping on you? And he goes, I had like a baseball cap and I was standing in a sound monitor. I was just like hanging out in the back. Wow. And I go, you wanted to go see them on your own. He goes, nobody else wanted to go. I just fucking went to the show by myself. I was like, dude, I can identify with that. 100% you can. (laughs) So he just told me he wanted to see Discharge while he had a night off in England and Metallica was fucking playing in England and he was at the same goddamn show. In a fucking arena, he goes to the punk show by himself. And this random small club. That says a lot about him too. So I got done. Holy shit. So we talked about a couple of other things. We talked about music and I at one point I mentioned something about Metallica that I knew that was like like a fact that wasn't like something that people would know. I forget what it was. But he went, you really are like a, a music fan or something. He made this thing. And I go, yeah, dude, fuck. And I'm like, I, I really, I'm really into all kinds of like, um, you know, uh, uh, facts about bands and stuff like that. I go, yeah. it isn't really anything that's ever going to serve me in any kind of a way, but it's all things I'm super interested in. And he's like, no, it's totally cool. I love it. So I get done with the tattoo and I was like, okay, well, I wanted to stretch it out longer because we were getting along talking and shit. It was cool. Yeah. But I go, well, I think that's it. I think that's all of it. It's about all I can do to it. I can't think of anything else I can do to make it look cool he go, or to make it look better than what, we, what you got. So he goes, all right. And I go, check it out. He goes over to the mirror, swear to God. He holds his hands up like this and he goes, ha, 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 like in that fucking Metallica song, <laughs> like, in, like in Enter Sandman, dude, with a laugh. He's looking at his fingers making that that's laugh. so ill, dude. And, and so then I was like, fucking, this is a good day, man. This is a good day. So... um. <laughs> He takes out, he, his hands are like bleeding, his yeah. like new tattoos on his fingers and shit. He reaches in his pocket, he gets out his phone, gives it to the helper who gave me the appointment or the, gave me the job and goes, hey, would you mind taking a picture of me and him together before I ever no said anything? No way, dude. Swear to God. So I'm like with <laughs> him like this and we took pictures together. He's like, cool, man. Thanks a lot. It was all him. You have the picture still? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. It was good. Is that one of the craziest moments as far as walk-ins and person, people you tattooed? That was the craziest walk-in ever. Ever. For, for sure. But there's been other people you tattooed that you've been really excited about. That yeah, yeah, totally. The you, the you best expect to. the best thing about that one though is that not it wasn't a tattoo in like a small little area or like a name somewhere where nobody could see. It's right on his hands. Everybody sees that, and everybody sees it. It's so crazy. Fuck! Did you ever see him after that? No. You know what's wild is. Leah ended up buying me a pair of ski gloves off of Metallica's website <laughs> that, what? yeah, with fingerless ski gloves that say Riff Life on the fingers that are just like the tattoos that I did oh, on him. dude. And I, I have them. I have them. Holy shit. <laughs> it's crazy. Frankie Owens, you're going to make that connection. He worked with Metallica for like 10 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. I talked to Frankie a long time about Metallica because I guess he tattooed James's neck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We ended up talking about that. That's such a fucking crazy story, man. Yeah, it's so wild. It's so wild. But these are the <laughs> these are the things that to me are like part of like the magic of things that happen in the tattoo uh, in the tattoo world and like being a tattooer. Like it, it doesn't matter how far along it comes or what people's ideas of tattoos are that change or the way that the public perception of tattoos are, any of that stuff. There's still things like that that can happen that happened to me just up there completely randomly that are like magical 
connection. Those moments and shit. So bonding by music and shit, everything. Everything about the reason why I tattoo, what drew me to it in the first, what uh, the, the my favorite tattoos to do that are music m- musically connected tattoos. Yeah. That's what happened, and that was not planned. It Dude, just that's fucking fate. It's crazy, man. Somehow, whatever that is, it, the, the, it's like fate or something that brings those things together and make them happen. And if you're in the right moment at the right time, and you uh, you're you're truly in like submerged in the whole thing, and you end up doing that, those things can happen, and they did. Yeah. Did you ever feel like quitting tattooing? No. Never once have I ever thought about not tattooing. Never once have I ever thought about being burnt out or not wanting to tattoo. That's amazing. Never once in my entire life. I've never ever thought to myself, fuck this. There's not uh, this isn't something that I that I that I want to do even after a bad experience or a crazy customer or a weird tattoo coming out different than than you thought that it would or any of those things. Never have I ever had that thought. That the o- the only thing I ever think of is like when I'm off of work for three days is man I got to get to the shop and like I just have to organize this color or I have yeah. to like do this tattoo yeah. or I got to order this shit yeah or you know not just the tattooing itself but everything that goes along with it those are all things that I live for in it, 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 it that just as equally as like I'm married to Leah and I'm, I have a family and yeah. music tattooing and all those things I'm married to all of that you balance to, it all too, together yeah yeah. yeah. So you feel like um, growing up a punk rock kid and, and from the home you came with, being the youngest out of five, um, and then raising kids and being a dad, like all the ethics and all the stuff you learned from punk rock, you use that in your everyday life, of course, right? It stays yeah. with you forever. Yeah, it doesn't ever go away. And it becomes such a thing that you don't really even consider or think of it. You just sort of, it just sort it's of is because routine. part of what you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy that like, as we are grown ups, we have responsibilities and pay mortgages and take our kids to school. But I think we're always going to be big kids because of, I think, the music we grew up on. It keeps you young. and It keeps you young. I think that it truly does. I think that it truly keeps you in a state of thinking. I don't feel like it's suspended adolescence. I don't feel that. I, yeah. don't, I don't think that it's a level of immaturity. I, don't, I never once have considered that. I think that it's something that keeps you in a frame of mind that you become adjusted to from when you very first got interested in it, where it doesn't stall you from doing the things that are important in your life that you must accomplish, yeah. but it influences all of that. Yeah. And one more thing. One more thing in the past. Were you ever a straight edge kid? I've never claimed straight edge. I like how you say it, straight edge. That's the right way to say it. Oh. That's what Ian says it. Straight edge. <laughs> straight edge. Not straight edge. It's straight edge. Well, straight edge. I'll say that. Who knows how to say it? What yeah. I will say though is that I've never taken a drug in my life. Yeah. Never in my life have I taken a drug. I smoked pot twice. And by smoking pot, I mean that I took a crack off of a joint in the back of a car on my way to see Black Flag when I was 15. Somebody passed me this joint. I took a hit off of it, and I, I kept going. And, the, and the, joint, the joint went back around. Yeah. And that was when I took the, this, this crack off this joint uh, when I was 15. And I did the same thing when I was um, 22, when I was... Uh, 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 at a cult show, I went to see the cult on New Year's Cult's Eve awesome. from 1989 to 1990 yeah. at Long Beach Sports Arena. And my brother's friend was standing next to me, and we didn't go to the show together, but we had the same seats. Yeah. And he um, had a joint, and he handed it to me, and I took a hit off of that. I handed it to the person that was next to me. So those are the two times that I've smoked weed ever in my life. Damn. I'm 51. I've never. I mean, t- two great concerts: the Colt and Black Flag. I yeah, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> they never did anything to me. By the way, speaking of which. Smoking weed, I, maybe you have to do it more. I don't really know, but doing that didn't make me feel any way. Okay. I've never taken a drug ever, ever in my life, ever have I taken a drug. I have to I have to really force myself to take any type of prescription drug because to me, that's a slippery slope. Okay. I feel like once you start like becoming reliant on any such of a, any such thing, yeah, it's just dangerous. I, I feel like that's a that that you you could easily go straight downhill, and I've seen it happen. Yeah, and uh, Nyquil, all that shit. It's not really. Swear to God, I was having a rough time sleeping not that long ago, and I remember uh, it was a couple years ago, and I was talking to you one time. You were on tour, and you said, "Oh, you could take uh, melatonin." Yeah, it's and natural. It's a natural thing. You could take it. So I felt okay because you told me that, yeah, that it was the cool. Yeah, store. It's straight edge, people. So, uh, yeah. so I did. I did. It helped me sleep. Yeah. And then, uh, but 
anytime that there's any kind of a prescribed thing from a doctor that or something like that, I have a really hard time. This happens to go back to what I was talking about with members of my family that like didn't do good in school and shit like yeah. that. There was issues with that. Okay. And so I may have had some kind of subliminal feeling in and in, or it p- p- put into my brain that made me connect that well, I got to I got to do all right in school or at least try and I got to stay away from this bullshit because this that can't end well. Yeah. And then through music and th- being b- exposed to punk rock and the kind of people that sometimes it draws. Yes. And also the tattoo world which has the same element. Yes. Sometimes more. I think through seeing those things and sometimes not even knowing what it was at the mm-hmm. time, you know, like yeah. I was so fucking young that I didn't know what people were doing. I was blind to it because I had no interest. Yeah. I was interested in music and tattoos and that kind of stuff. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that kind yeah. of stuff, when people were doing it, I wasn't ever, uh, I didn't ever feel drawn to it. So whenever people were doing it around me, I was bl- kind of blind to it because I didn't know. I, I didn't, was naive for did, sure. For did, that shit. Didn't care. Yeah. Didn't know. Yeah. It was part of your world. So because of not really knowing what it was or wanting to know what it was, I was just shielded as somehow from uh, being involved in it in any way. Yeah. It wasn't like somebody was pushing it on me and me going like, oh God, no, I can't take it. It was just never fucking came up. Yeah. It was never important. So that's, that's what that was. That's amazing. My whole entire life, too. Yeah, and I, I mean, at 51 now, I don't really feel like I'm, it's going to become part of my no. life. <laughs> <laughs> Starting super late. Yeah, forget it. I'm going to try okay. weed when I'm 60. No, nah, I'm good. Um, do you consider yourself an optimistic or pessimistic person? It's both. I have to say it's both. <laughs> I try to be optimistic about things, as anybody would. But there are f- times when I feel like being optimistic about stuff comes naturally to people in certain situations. And I feel like my reaction sometimes is pessimistic towards the same things. And I feel like it has to do with exposure to punk because not go against the grain. You mean go against, yeah, yeah. not because it's not because it's a negative (laughs) reaction, not because punk rock is a negative thing, but because of questioning something, questioning everything. Right. So somebody going like, Oh, it's totally okay. And my first reaction is no, it's fucking not. (laughs) <laughs> it could it couldn't be okay what do you yeah. mean is that just to, to stir a conversation or it gets i don't know it would be it would be in any <laughs> in any certain period of time like there'd be a realist yeah i think it's more realism yeah and not being taken advantage of in some ways and if yeah. it means that you have to turn up a wall or some sort of a negativity thing of like no 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 no, no. fuck that that it can come across as being pessimistic in some ways to me i feel like it's a a, necess- a necessity sometimes yeah and then, do you have any like daily rituals or anything you do like every, every, every day? Every day. What, what you got? Everything, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real serious moment, too. <laughs> I know you get your haircut like every certain week. I know all that every, shit. Like, every, every week. Every week. Every week you get your haircut. Every week I get my haircut. I cut my nails on the same day every day. I cut my toenails on the same day every As day. As the haircut? No, 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 no. They, they, they each have a day, too. Are you OCD or no? In the worst way, Toby. It's like I have I have insane hangups wow. with OCD. It used to be so much worse. It, it's it's way better now. Okay, but I used to have the worst time getting through anything. Damn, no medication for that. No, no, hell no. That's amazing. And I I, I, I went through having kids. You have to let some things go by. Hundred percent. You have to let some things fall a- away. Yeah. So that was the beginning of it. And then uh, Leah, I, I have to say, I've name checked her so many times during this thing. I realized this amazing that, wife Leah. She's awesome. What up, Leah? I realized that uh, she has helped me through so many things that I didn't even realize were issues to yeah. begin with. Yeah, we've talked in the past for sure. Yeah, where she has said, like, look, you know, maybe you don't need to worry so much about this thing. It's okay, mm-hmm. and, and I, the, it's helped me a lot. So that's awesome. So do you drink coffee every day? Every single day. That's one of your things? Yes, but I can only drink it once a day now, Toby, because uh, I used to drink it more than once a day. I used to like to drink it more than once a day, but when you get a little bit older, it fucks with your stomach and you can't yeah. really do it as much. Yeah. So I, I drink the same thing at the same place every day. And when I'm away from home on work trips or what you know, when we're away from home, I find a way to do the exact same thing someplace else. What's crazy is that Rusty mentioned the day too is as kids, we listen to punk rock. You think adults only drink coffee, but then you had like the descendants being coffee mug, mug, mug. I know. And like all the coffee logos, like what the, 
These punk rockers are drinking coffee. That's like for adult grown-ups. I know. It's Our, so weird. That's funny that you say that because through the Descendants uh, thing, I, I saw, uh, I, I was just talking about this show. The first time that I saw them was with Black Flag, Bad Brains, and Descendants at this place called the Ukrainian Cultural Center. It's on Melrose here in Los damn, Angeles. Damn, Melrose. Was, I was 15. Wow. And it's like when you get, coming up here from Orange County, when you get off on Melrose, you usually turn left to go down to where the short stores are and towards your house here. Yep. Not that you live on Melrose, but it's more towards yeah. this way. It, you you would make a right and you go back the other direction on Melrose, like kind of going the other way. And there was this place called the Ukrainian Cultural Center where I ended up seeing a couple punk shows. One of them was The Descendants. And I kind of, this was uh, 83. So this was uh, beginning of my interest with, with that band. And then through them, I knew that they drank coffee. And okay. it was just a concept to me. I just thought like, you know, like, oh, they drink coffee. They could have said that they go, you know, roller skating. Totally. And I would have gone, oh, I would have sparked my interest in, like, I wonder what they do roller skating. Exactly. Because you couldn't look it up, like, on a computer no. or look it up on your phone and go, oh, look, there's pictures of people roller skating. This looks interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You would just imagine it. The sentence in Maximum Rock and Roll to roller skating ring. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So so the the thing with coffee, I was like, oh, they drink coffee. I wonder what they do with that. I wonder what it is. I wonder why you would drink coffee. Who knows about that? My mom drinks it, you know? Yeah. So I started asking for coffee at school. No way. I dude. swear to God, I would go to school and then in the morning, my mom would drop me off where I'd walk. I'd get there early and people would get like, you know, they had breakfast, like a breakfast program. So I would be like, hey, can I get coffee? And I was friends with the lady who did the thing. She's like, Lindsay, you're kind of pushing it. I was like, I don't know. I just get a cup of coffee. I don't want hot chocolate coffee. So I started drinking it then. No way. Not crazy drinking it, but that was when I tried it, it was through that. It's fucking all your default. It's all your fault to send is getting people hooked on caffeine. <laughs> you remember Jolt Kohler? Oh, yeah. Cola? Jolt. Hell yeah. Dude, it was like you were scared. You had to have the Jolt Kohler. It was so crazy. I like remember that. Jolt with the logo. Yeah. The lightning bolt and the O. Yeah. I think maybe it was like an ad for it in a skate magazine or something. They kind of blew it up to be that drink. Yeah. I, I remember this. What was your favorite skate trick? Uh, frontside grind always will be. Sick. Always frontside grind. Yeah. I, I think that there's nothing more stylish. I think that there's nothing there, there's nothing more. I mean, it's not that tricky, but it's super stylish and cool. And when you approach it, and you slide for a ways, and you're not like shaky. There's nothing cooler or, yeah. or more stylish than frontside grind. Were you a pool guy, a ramp guy? Is what you were? Pool all the way because it, this when I first started getting involved in skateboarding, ramps were nowhere near they as prevalent. You're right. They as, weren't as as concrete pools, pools and downhill and shit back then. Yeah, 100. Yeah. percent Yeah. So I would like go to you know like even at the skate park that I used to go to skater cross when I was super young, there was a concrete run like a concrete okay. snake run with no ramp. It was just like a ramp. That you, a long ramp that you went down to gain speed to hit the run. Fuck. And then two, year, two three years later, they made two pools because people were like, how come you guys don't have a pool here to skate? Yeah. So that was, that, that was what I knew. It was concrete pools. Fuck, man. So skateboarding, music, tattoos, it's all connected, man. It's all, all connected. I feel like all of it is so much more connected than people really think. Yeah. You know, or even until you start talking about it, it's all very, very uh, par- one and the same, part of the same thing. Yeah. You would think you were you were, you were a musician too, because you love music so much. You still go to shows all the time by yourself, obviously with your fam too. We go to shows and uh-huh. like, you still love it. You're still a fan. You buy music. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. It's like you love it so much, but you, you know, you had the guitar for a minute. It wasn't for you. And now it, your daughter's playing it. It's awesome. Yeah. I, 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 to me, going to shows are something that I'll never stop doing. I'll never stop doing that. Yeah. Like uh, recently, we were all at that Chromax show at the yep. Roxy together. Yeah. And I'll never not be in the front for that. I'll, yeah. I'll always be in the front singing yeah. Chromax songs. Or Even your kids aren't, but you are. It's awesome. Yeah, I know. I love it. I love that. I know. I, I li- like I say, man, I live for those things. I and know. It, to me, it doesn't seem like there's some sort of weird idea that I get sometimes from people who feel like going to shows and being a part of that stuff is somehow childish or out of your uh, age range. 100%, dude. Dude, Toby, I don't understand that. I, I honestly know. don't get that. I'm not I saying I don't get it because other people do and I'm going against it. Yeah. It's because I don't understand that concept. It doesn't me make too. sense to me. Me either, man. Yeah. And you're watching John Joseph, 55 years old, killing it more than fucking kids half his age. 100%. It's like... It's hard to explain the music. It's hard to explain like why we go to shows, why we love that music. Because it's so, even though people thought it blew up for a while and punk rock was exposed and it was not nobody, it's still very underground and it's something fairly special. You know what I mean? It will never not be. There's always an element of that that's underground. Yeah, I, I'm like, I'm I'm going on my first tour where I'm gonna like roadie for a band. You are. I am with Sharp Shock. Yes. 
What tour? The one coming up? Yeah. Oh, shit. Awesome. Totally going to go and like uh. do the thing where you spend the night, go to the show and set up, which I've done, but usually just like a day. Yeah. This is something where I'm going to leave which home. Which tour is it? The one Bouncing Souls? Y- it, no, 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 no. I'm going to go to the one. The with, Cali ones. The, the, yeah. Sick. Drive out, spend the night, set up the thing, drive to the next show. I've never done it. Wow. So I'm super You've excited. already gone as like a fan of the band and see the band. You never went behind the scenes and did that shit. No, I know what behind the scenes is like do, a yeah. little bit, but this will be the first time that I get to go on fucking tour roadie job, dude, which I'm like, I'm really excited about this. I love that. Another thing I want to mention too, too, is that people, when they have kids, sometimes feel like gonna, their lives are going to change and, they, and they're not going to be able to do what they love anymore. But people don't realize that your kids adapt to your life. And whether your kids get into the same things you do, they're exposed to all that shit. And both our families are like that. Totally. And it's like your kid loves hardcore and your daughter's playing music. I know she loves Alkaline Trio. And it's like... You take them to all these different diverse shows and shit. I think it's awesome, man. The best part about that is that not through exposure from, not directly from exposure from me or Leah or the lives that they've yeah, been like, around. Yeah, listen to this. Look like this. We're not, it's not like that at all. Never. Swear to ne- God. Never. I've always said, like, whatever you're into. Like, the first, sh- the first shows that my daughter went to that I took her to were... Um, uh, uh, the a uh, One Direction. We yeah, saw we Max saw love Justin Bieber. Yeah, back then we yeah. saw them like three or four times at big big shows. Yeah, how were they? It was killer. Yeah, it's like a great production. It was awesome. Yeah, but that that was what her interest was, and I want to be able to to um embrace f- that, f- embrace it, and facilitate the interest. Hundred percent. You know, like a, if it's not mine, even better. Yeah, fucking cool. You figured the shit out yourself. Yeah, rad. Yeah, and she opened your mind, exposed you to One Direction, something you never go to. Totally. So yeah, Max was Justin Bieber. He's into all that kind of stuff. And now, I told Freddie the other day, like Max seen Madball. He sees all these bands when he's younger, and he doesn't really have their records. He sees all his uncles, whatever, it's crazy music. But the other day, I came in, Max is doing his homework, listening to Pride by Madball. I was like, "What are you doing?" He goes, "Oh, I bought the Madball record. I love it." And it's like he, it's almost like he knew about it the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And now he found it for himself. I didn't buy it for him. He bought it for himself. He's listening to it. I never said listen to Madball. These are your uncles. Right. He saw the show. He thought it was cool, but it wasn't his thing. And now he's listening on his own. It's fucking awesome, man. It's rediscovery of it. Yeah. Like it's somehow in your subconscious, and you kind of know. Yeah. A little bit. Like Keith is a little bit like that with tattoos now. Like he's always kind of had a feeling about it and things like that. But now he understands there's a deeper level and that he's pursuing on his own. Yeah. yeah. So he's gonna be a tattoo artist. It's been tattooing. It's crazy wow that's amazing man great painter fucking great painter yeah dude picked up on the flash thing right away totally knows how to figure it out flash really 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 quickly and does it well Mm -hmm. is for sure making paintings that are as nice as the ones that i make and it's taken me a super much longer time to figure that out he on his own very responsibly wanted to tattoo himself with supervision from me he did three on himself. Each one uh, focused on a different thing. Uh, he he wanted to do an outline the fir- or he wanted to do a tattoo the first time that kind of had more to do with outline and shading and a little bit of color, which is something that he wanted to get a handle on. Which mm-hmm. the only way to get a handle on is to do it exactly. So, so he did that after hours on a Friday. Then after hours, uh, oh, that was on his birthday too. By the way, that was okay. on his twenty fourth birthday. Fucking awesome. He did his own tattoo on himself, first one ever. Sick. Then uh, the second one that he did was uh, Friday, same thing. On a Friday, he wanted to do a color tattoo, so he drew up a butterfly, did it all in color, healed up good. Damn. I mean, it's not a perfect tattoo, but yeah. they're, they're never going to be perfect. No. Not now. Yeah. Well, never really any of them are. What can you do? Yeah, it's, it's true. A, it's a human doing the fucking thing, you know? Yeah. So no matter how long you've been doing it, they're not going to be 100% perfect. It's a no. tattoo. It's what they are. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> he's trying to perfect that and get a handle on it better. So he did a color tattoo and healed up good. Then he wanted to do, he told me himself, this is his, his huh. words, that he wanted to pull back the reins and concentrate on doing outlines and something solid black, all on his own. This is, without, this is without my guidance or anything yeah. like that. I mean, I guided him while he was doing it, but the decision to do it, his own. Yeah. These are all on himself. At that point, considering how well the paintings are looking and that he's making some pro- progress completely on his own with his own decisions involving tattoos, um, <clears throat> I ran it by Tim. Tim was like, hey, maybe you should bring in some friends and like tattoo him, you know, tattoo some friends, do some stuff wow. on some other people. So starting last Friday, he did a tattoo, simple, you know, not anything crazy. The, the customers understand that it's not some like, I want to get a demon with mm-hmm. a fucking paradise and some yeah. fire. It's that's we're nowhere near that part. Yeah. But 
he did like a heart with a banner and an arrow on his friend's leg. So now he's kind of getting into tattooing uh, some friends. It's not, it's not for money. This is apprenticeship shit. Yeah. This is precisely what I fucking went through when I first started. Yeah. And this is what I'm really very proud of is the maturity level of knowing now, okay, I've been a helper in tattoo shop for about a year and a half for real mm-hmm. working in a tattoo shop. I'm, I want to pursue tattooing and I pretty much know that this is the way that I should do it. Don't get ahead of myself. Concentrate on one thing at a time. Start tattooing friends on Fridays at, you know, pretty much after hours. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's very, very impressive and I'm so proud of that. And it, not, not just because it's what I do. I'd be proud of him no matter what he decided exactly. to do. But I'm super proud of being able to help along with something. Because yeah. had he decided to be, you know, an engineer or something like a, a work on a car or yeah. something like that, I have very, very highly, very limited information about those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, but me too. but if he wanted to, if he wanted to, you know, like like I say, he wants to learn how to tattoo. I'm like, fucking, this is great, dude. I it's know a, how to, I know how to help you with I that. I know, man. So it's a good thing. And it's kind of was it was out of nowhere. Or just kind of like you, like you, you weren't sure you wanted to tattoo, and then all of a sudden. You, no, he kind of said that he wanted to tattoo for a long time. He said, like, this is something that I would learn to do. But I think that he would even tell you that at the time that he told me that the first time, he wasn't ready to do something like that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't something that he was truly knew what it involved. Yeah. Because there's a whole lot of other shit that goes along with tattooing besides doing a tattoo that stays on somebody's skin. 100%. There's, there's, that's like 15% of it. Yeah. And then the whole other rest of the shit that goes along with it is what you have to learn and really get a grip on. Yeah. That stuff is is it's it can't be described. It yeah. has to, it's like being in a band. It would be like if you were in a band and you loved the idea of it until you play a hundred times with your band, hundred percent, you don't know about what it's like to go up on a stage, be yeah. in front of a crowd, anticipate their reaction, know how the show's going, know that the sound is going okay. All those things, yeah, those are all those factors of like playing a show that mm-hmm. nobody thinks of. I know. The people that go to see the band, they're like, fucking cool, H2O is going to play. Or fucking cool, I want to go see Rancid or whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? So they're in the crowd, they're watching the band, and they're listening to the songs that are played on the set list. There's all so many other things that go along with that. So many things, man, that, moving parts. That the moving parts that people, that unless you were in the band or unless you really were around it, like truly underneath it and around it all that time, you would never fucking know. Yeah. I feel like it's the same comparison with tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. That if you, you know, if you, it, it, unless you're inside of it, then the tattoo part itself is like the person going, getting the tattoo is like the person going to the show. Exactly. Like the person who goes <laughs> to the show, they get to watch the band. They're mm-hmm. stoked. They're like, fucking cool. I got to see the band. Yeah. Right. Then they leave. They think about it. That's what happens when someone goes and gets a tattoo. Mm-hmm. They choose the tattoo. I'm going to go and get this fucking thing. It's at this time on this day. I'm going to go do this thing. Yeah. It's like plans to go to have a ticket to go to see a concert. Yeah, it's true. Right. So all the things that go into place to put that on there and then leave the memory with them, that's all the shit that he's got to learn now. Yeah. Which he now is starting to get a handle on, which is super beautiful to see that he's truly taking that part in. Yeah, he's like being passionate about it and actually learning and not like trying to like, well, this is just easy to do. I'm just going to do it. Because my dad did. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not really where he's coming from. And he has an artistic standpoint on things and is able to draw shit up and is able to- So cool, man. And has like kind of a more modern- uh, version and look at the way that he thinks tattoos should look, which is super fucking, that's impressive, man. Like there's people that are tattooing today that do it for money that are, that are successful that don't really have that view. Yeah. They see things of something that like they see the way that tattoos are done and the way they look on their phone or the way that they see them on like in, on the computer or something like yeah. that. And they think that they that they want them to look that way because they see them that way. But I feel like my son's version of things is the way that he's seeing it is like, it's different than that. He's going like, yeah, the stuff that's on my phone and all that shit is cool, but I kind of see it this way. It's fucking awesome, man. It's kind of rad. I got to admit, man. You must be proud because that's... that's Super, super proud. I'm gonna, I, w- I want to quickly say, speaking of pride, there th- that is a word that I didn't really identify with at all and didn't really understand the feeling of what it was until much later in my life. So when I was younger, I may, I feel like there wasn't many things that I was super proud of because I wasn't in that much control of the things that were surrounding me. There were things that were going on around me that I didn't really have any control over. So I didn't really understand the thing of pride, like being proud. Yeah. 
I knew what that word was. I knew that there were people who threw that word around or said it or like, I'm proud of this or I'm proud of you. I didn't hear that shit. So I didn't really know. Got you. I didn't connect it to things. Makes sense. So when I when I reached the like ten year mark of tattooing, I remember feeling like this feeling of like, oh man, I'm happy about that. That's like a thing that makes me feel uh, filled with happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pride. Pride. So. Proud of how far you come and what you've achieved, everything. Yeah, it was I mean, the, it be. It's the same thing with my kids. Mm-hmm. I, 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 when I, then when I reached the 20-year mark, when I got to 27 this year, right, <sighs> knowing that my kids are doing okay and that uh, my, you know, m- my life in general is good, yeah. I'm able to accept now and be aware of n- something that I was unaware of before which was feeling proud of something and like the feeling of being like, man, I'm proud of my kid. Yeah, I'm proud of him having a vision of his own. I'm proud of my daughter for doing well in school and being able to do things like play guitar that I was never able to do. Yeah, I was able to stick with some stick with something for a super long period of time and do tattoos. And these are, and uh, you know, having like my my wife is with me and we're able to you know do things together Travel, and, and she anything, yeah. and she's doing well these are things I'm, these are things i'm proud of yeah. that i now i'm able to identify with and feel the that feeling and know like man that's like a really good feeling and it must be that i'm proud of it it's fucking awesome man it's full circle man with everything the way you came up and then now raising kids and what your kids are doing i think it's I think we're doing good, bud. I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we cover a lot. We did two hours. We cover a lot of shit, man. Do we? Do we talk for two hours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think we cover a lot of things. Any other stories we should talk about? There's one more story that maybe want to tell, but you yelling at somebody and she didn't recognize you yelling somebody's name. Oh, oh yeah. What was yeah. that story? You mean um, at what? At Dancing with the Stars? Yeah. When I was shaking my fist at her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who was she? Brooke Burke. Okay. If you're listening, which you're not. Well, if you happen to be, I wasn't shaking my fist at you out of any kind of weird, uh, you know, anger. It was because I recognized you. didn't really know what else to do. Okay. I'm a fan of Dancing with the Stars. I'm a big fan of Dancing with the Stars, the show. That's awesome. I've, I've loved it since it started. And Leah, my wonderful wife, Leah, uh, made it possible for us to go and see Dancing with the Stars being filmed five or six times. Sick. Uh, so on one of those times, Leah could not go. And I went with one of her friends. She had to work. Uh, this is long before the days of now where tr- with travel and stuff like that. This yeah. is years ago. So I was sitting, uh, they'll seat you in different places when you're in the crowd at Dancing with the Stars. And at this time I was seated in the balcony above the judging table. If anybody's familiar with the show, I'm super familiar with it. The judging table was right beneath us and then the dance floor is out there and you're watching the whole thing being That's filmed awesome. and all this stuff. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm up above... Uh, this is on the season that Donny Osmond won <laughs> <laughs> Dancing with the Stars. And uh, I'm up above the judging table, and she stood up, and I knew her from this show called uh, Rockstar, Rockstar, or something like that. Okay. They were trying to get a singer for In Excess. Oh, I she, remember that show. She, I remember that show. And it was after the singer died, and they were, having a, they were auditioning people through this reality TV show. She was part of it. That's right. Okay. I thought she was really pretty, and she was cool, whatever, and she was like cool, like rock style chick. So, <laughs> so she's... Um, she was uh, one of the hosts of the show, not one of yeah. the judges, but one of the hosts. Yeah. So she was standing up here, and this is ap- after the crowd was uh, being let out of the place after they stopped filming. I stood up, and I leaned over the thing, and I go, Brooke, <laughs> right? And she heard me. It's, it's easy if you're yelling inside a sound yeah. studio, they, they hear yeah. you, right? So she looked up, and I, I didn't know what to say once I got her attention, so I started shaking my fist at her and going like this, <laughs> you. I pointed at her and shook my fist. Like, and, like, to me, it looks like I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> so stupid. You're waving your fist and pointing. What did she and do? And I'm up above her, too. She's looking up, and her, up and What the fuck shit? is wrong with this dude? And she goes, hi. And I went like this. I <laughs> shook my fist at her some more, Toby. And then she goes, it's like nice. The old, like the old puppets in the Muppets sitting in the balcony. Yeah. And uh-huh. she goes, nice to see you. And I go, you too, shaking my fist. <laughs> she turned away. I'm sure she was like, security, get this fucking dude out of here. Who's this guy with tattoos waving a fist at me? I thought that story was amazing because you just caught in the moment. You don't know how to react. Like, I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to go, oh, I saw you on TV. I think you're awesome. So I just shook my fist at her. It's so silly. Oh, my God. On that note, Lindsay, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for everything you've done in your life. Thanks for being my friend. Thanks for all the amazing tattoos in my body. I'm sure people have seen the tattoos done in me. Um, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I'm proud of you. I'm happy to call you my friend, amazing father. Uh, shout out to Leah. Shout out to your kids. 
Um, anybody else you shout out? I think that covers everybody. Oh, I'd like to say... Uh, say whatever you want. I'd like to say... Um, uh, hello to my friends and the people that uh, have been very nice to me throughout the time that I've known them. Dan and Scully Smith. Yeah, what up? Shout out. Dave and Candy Peters. <laughs> Jeff and Sarah. I love all of you guys. Tim, Elizabeth, I love you. Thank you very much for all of your support. We're, and getting, to- you, we're getting you on here too, Tim. Toby, yeah, Tim's next. Tim's next. I'm going to hit him up. Toby, I love you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being here, man. That was awesome. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Bye. To the One Life One Chance podcast, I'm your host Toby Morris. Today is my first ever, ever, ever tattoo artist. My good friend Lindsey Carmichael is here today on the on the show. He's done several tattoos of me, including my whole entire butt as a spiderweb. Welcome to the show, Lindsey Carmichael. Thank you. <laughs>